Good evening, everyone. This is Reshma Shete, HR Manager in Epicons Consultant Hello. and today's webinar coordinator. I welcome our senior guest, PC Basu sir, our speaker, all the panelists and participants in the webinar. Today's webinar subject is Structural Design of Tall Buildings and Podium and Basement. Before proceeding, I request all like, share and subscribe our YouTube channel to get daily updates. I request uh, all the panelists to mute yourselves. All the participants, please put your questions in QA box, not in the chat box. Without wasting much time, I briefly introduce Mr. Jayan Kulkarni, who is founder member and managing director at Epicons Consultant since 1985. He has graduated from VZTI Mumbai, further pursued his master's in structures in the same college. He has specific interests in various areas of engineering like codal provision, seismic retrofitting, tall buildings, concrete mix design, advanced entity and evaluation, conservation of heritage structures, and Indian aesthetics. Epicons has successfully completed more than 8,500 projects under his technical and administrative leadership in multiple avenues of civil engineering like structural design, project management, architectural, NDT, and infra. Company has received many prestigious awards. The most respected award is Industrial Excellence Award from Institute of Engineers. Now I request Jan sir to introduce EFC. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thanks. Epicon Friends of Concrete. Next slide, please. Epicon Friends of Concrete. Each in is an activity which is carried out under umbrella of Epicon's Consulted Private Limited. It is ISO 9001-2015 certified company. One of the objectives of the company is to impart technical knowledge to society and interested parties and we started at Friends of Concrete much before we got ISO certification, that is since 1999. Next. Our inspiration goes back to our friend, philosopher, and guru, late Epimedius. Next. EFC has conducted 79 workshops in the last 21 years and 36 webinars in the last two years. Started webinar series since lockdown through our unit EFC dedicated to training. These are two photographs of the workshop when we used to conduct physical workshops in the past. EFC is a number effort to create knowledge sharing platform and develop a facility for continued education for a practicing structural engineer, corporate consultant, government, semi-government authorities, architects, builders, and of course, faculty and student. Next, our thought leaders. Apart from Mr. Remedius, who gave us inspiration for conducting training because he was a very good trainer. Uh, our thought leaders, especially in the field of earthquake engineering, the first and foremost is Dr. P. C. Basu. Coincidentally, he is present in today's webinar. But originally, entire credit goes to my teachers, Dr. Vien Gupchuk, principal then, Professor Sundaram, head of structure engineering department then, and Professor M. G. Gargil. And when we started with earthquake engineering, we got inspiration from Dr. Sudhir Jain and Dr. Murthy, whose courses we attended and also conducted many programs with them. Next. And in the quick overview of the webinars, today we are 134. Coincidentally, 35 and 36 has already happened. Today we are at discussion on first division of uh, 16,700 and is on today. And our next workshop will be a physical workshop for government of Maharashtra periodic persons, structural audit, 
role of NDT, case studies, and repairs methodology. Next. Apart from myself, our EFC team, it consists of Mr. Anand Kulkarni, Mr. Ravindra Deshpande, Mr. Arvind Parvekar, Mr. Parashar Mogi, and PP Pandey. All of them are directors and unit heads. They take very active part in developing, conceiving, and making all our webinars and workshops successful. With this, I complete the introduction of a conference of concrete, and I thank all my staff member directors, including all the staff, including Mia and Reshma, who are coordinated today. Thank you. Over to Reshma. Thank you, sir. Now I introduce our principal moderator and Epicons director, Mr. Anand. Anand Kulkarni. He is graduated from 1987. Further, he studies PG from a specialization in structures from SPC and Lady. He has total 34 years of experience in the field of structural design. His expertise includes design of tall buildings involved in the design of more than uh, 100 tall structures ranging from 100 meter to 250 meter height for leading developers. He is a member of ACI. These are a few glimpses of his project to Noel Pinnacle, Mumbai, Mahindra Roots, Mumbai, and Raymond Towers, Thani. Uh, I quickly introduce our moderator, uh, Mr. A. S. Parvekar. He is B. Civil from SPCA, Mumbai, M. Structure from University of Padodra in 1990, working with Epicons Consultants since 1989. <laughs> Past 21 years, he is a director of Epicons Consultant Handling NDT and Structural Assessment Department, conducting training programs on NDT for PWD Meta Nasik, ISSC Mumbai, PWD Thane, Sirko Navi Mumbai, and of course, webinars of EFC. Appointed by auditor by RMCMA for RMC grants in 2010-12. His work on 2000, uh, more than 2,500 projects, including structural assessment projects, large volume entity projects, complex charging structural design projects, and infra projects. He has uh, in-house well-equipped NBA lab, a critical lab, with the help of team members of 35 engineers and engineer, uh, technicians. Now I request Jain sir for the preamble. Friends, as such, this program doesn't need preamble, but how we started with this subject. Good afternoon, everyone. Taft India Standard Criteria for Structural Safety of Tall Concrete Building, first division of 16,700, was widely circulated by BIS on 15 July 2022. BIS has requested to examine the draft and forward our views, stating any difficulties which we are likely to experience in our business or profession. If, and finally, it will be included in Indian standard. The last date of sending comments was 16 September, 2022. Many senior practitioners and professionals have already sent their comment and suggestion individually. And many of the structural engineering associations conducted open discussion sessions and compiled the uh, various views and sent to them jointly. Now this is a parallel process. As many of us are consulting engineers, we are finding it difficult to implement the current version of code for some specific issues. Analysis of multiple towers on a single podium or basement is one of such issues. All of us know that structurally it is best recommended to separate such towers from podium by expansion joint. However, for various construction and serviceability related concerns, it is growing train to avoid such expansion joints at the junction. This results in a challenge to structural engineers to model, analyze the correct behavior in a practical possible manner. And that is how we have conceived this subject for the webinar. This webinar is continued effort to understand the various difficulties faced by practicing consultants, especially with reference to 16,700, we have conducted about three different webinars on a similar subject. 
and this seminar is being conducted by none other than Professor Dr. Yogendra Singh. He is very knowledgeable, expert, and very popular trainer and professor. With this note, and please also note that we have 45 minutes question and answer session after his lecture. Please do put your questions in chat box, but beyond that, or you have one more chance at the end of the lecture. With this, I complete my preamble. Hand over to Reshma. Thank you, Jain sir. Now I'll introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Yogendra Singh. Dr. Yogendra Singh is currently Railway Bridge Chair Professor of Earthquake Engineering at IIT Roorkee. He is B.E. Civil Engineering from IIT Roorkee, M.Tech and Ph.D. Structural Engineering from IIT Delhi in 90 and 1994. His research interest includes performance-based design of buildings and bridges, seismic vulnerability and risk evaluation, non-linear modeling and analysis, and seismic evaluation and retrofitting of structures. He is about 25 years of research and teaching experience. He has published 65 research articles in various journals and presented more than 100 papers in national and international conferences. He is member of several expert teams for post-earthquake damage survey. He is convener of BIS expert group on performance-based seismic design of structures. He collaborated with Norzer Norway, NGI Norway, NTU Singapore, Stanford University USA, University of Edinburgh UK, University of Windsor Canada, University of California US and University of Porto Portugal. I welcome Yogendra Singh sir and request him to start with the lecture. Thank you. Thank you Reshma. So I will share my screen now. So I think my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So thanks once again, giving me this opportunity and thank you all the participants joining uh, today with us on this important topic, tall buildings with podium and basement. Because the buildings with podium and basement have complex dynamic properties. And as a result, their seismic analysis and design a little bit cumbersome. And uh, we will try to refer IS 16700 wherever required. Uh, but please keep in mind that I'm not a member of the team, uh, BIS team, which has written this code. So some of the uh, interpretations which I'm going to give here are based on my understanding. So what the code committee has exactly thought about those, I'm not very sure, but what I understand best that I will try to share with you. And uh, I will limit mostly to the seismic analysis. And uh, we understand that if we understand the seismic behavior of the buildings, that we can extend easily to wind behavior as well, uh, at least to some extent. So I will try to focus on some critical issues which usually the practicing engineers are finding difficult and I will try to give the theory and philosophy behind those and uh, we, I will also try to discuss some of the clauses uh, line by line uh, where we have to uh, think about the interpretation of those clauses and uh, whatever your queries please do put in question answer session it would have been ideal if we were talking face to face and uh, you could ask your queries in between, but I'm sorry, unfortunately, that is not possible in this mode. So please do write your questions, queries, whenever those are arising in the question answer session. And at the end, we will try to discuss those. So any building, uh, whether it is tall or short, is subjected to two types of loads, vertical load and horizontal load. Vertical load is mainly arising due to gravity and horizontal load is arising due to wind and earthquake. 
So vertical load also we can consider, we can interpret as a as an acceleration equal to 1G, which is always acting vertically downward. And our dead load, live load, snow load, these are causing gravity load. Those are in the vertical direction. The earthquake forces and wind forces are primarily in horizontal direction. Earthquake and wind, as you know, has a vertical component as well, but the primary component is horizontal. And uh, as a result, we require a horizontal framing system to register the vertical load. So vertical load is registered by horizontal framing system primarily, or I should say that the design of the horizontal framing that is slab and beams is governed by the vertical load. Whereas the design of the vertical framing system consisting of frames, shear walls, masonry infills, et cetera, that is governed by horizontal force. So different lateral load registering systems, which we are using world over, are frames, which we all uh, commonly use, frame truss or brace frame, where a diagonal member is, in case of the steel structures, this is possible that we can provide a diagonal uh, member. Uh, and that diagonal member brace makes the frame to behave like a truss. And as a result, is stiffness and the strength both get enhanced. But the ductility gets compromised and we have to take care of that. And there is a form we will discuss here also, uh, eccentric brace frame, where we can achieve ductility also keeping uh, the advantage of uh, stiffness and strength. Then in case of uh, RCC buildings, we have shear walls and these shear walls are nothing but uh, elongated columns. One dimension is much larger as compared to the other. And as a result, the moment of inertia in that direction becomes quite high and this can register large lateral loads. And we can use shear walls along with frames. So what is what we call dual system or frame shear wall system and coupled shear walls. Coupled shear wall is a combination of frame and shear wall in such a way that it is having the stiffness and strength of shear wall. At the same time, through coupling beams, it is also having a frame action. And the combination of these two make the system quite efficient. Then we have core and outrigger system. In uh, this system, the core is made of either RCC walls, shear walls, and then there is a horizontal element, rigid horizontal element, what we call outrigger. It is connecting the columns. I will show some of the photographs. And the advantage is that the force in the columns, actual force in the columns is mobilized through this outrigger. And I will explain in the successive uh, slides that as we mobilize more and more actual action, the stiffness and strength enhance. Then we have frame truss outrigger system where in place of RCC core, we can have a brace frame in the core and the outrigger is connected to the, the brace frame and it is connecting some of the columns, exterior columns with that. And again, uh, enhancing the efficiency of the system. Then we can arrange the frames, especially the later load registering frames along the perimeter and we get a system which is similar to a tube, a hollow tube, where the little load adjusting material is uh, provided along the perimeter. And as we understand, a hollow tube made of the same material as a solid rod, as compared to a solid rod, is having much larger uh, moment of inertia. The frame tube has much higher efficiency than the frames, which are usually on the grid pattern. In tube in tube, we have an inner tube made of uh, shear wall usually, and the outer tube is made of frames. So it is similar to the dual system, which we have frame and shear wall, something similar, but in the form of tubes, two tubes. Then uh, the shear walls or brace frames can also be arranged in the form of channels or I sections along the plan, and that results in end channel frame tube uh, a truss can be combined with the tube. The truss behavior uh, is combined with the tube, which makes the system even more rigid. It combines the efficiency of both tube and truss, and it becomes trust tube. And then we have multi-cell tube to take care of the uh, shear leg. In case of frame tube, I will explain that the distribution of the forces in a flange is not uniform. It 
reduces towards the center due to what we call shear lag effect. So the shear lag effect can be reduced using multiple baths in a multi-cell tube. So first type of system which we understand and which we commonly use is the frame action. If we compare frame action uh, with a system having pinned, a portal having pinned joints. So here the columns are acting as cantilever and whatever force we apply is get distributed into both the columns and the columns bend like cantilever. And the moment which we are getting at the base is uh, P into H by two. Actually P by two is the force and H is the height. So it is P by two into H. So that is PH by two acting in both the uh, columns. Now, if these pin joints, which we have between beams and columns, if we make those rigid, we call it moment resisting frame or rigid jointed frame. Now, depending on the stiffness of the beam, the behavior of the frame will change. In first case, let us consider an infinitely rigid beam, which is another extreme. In the first case, we had pin jointed beam. That means the stiffness of the beam was not coming into picture or the stiffness of beam is, let us say, zero. In that case, the moment which we are getting at the base is pH by two. On the other hand, if we have infinitely rigid beam and it is connected rigidly to the columns, then the columns bend in double curvature and the effective height reduces to H by two. And as a result, the moment which we are getting is P by two into H by two, pH by four in both the columns. So we can see that the moment reduces to half and the remaining, because equilibrium is to be satisfied, the remaining moment is taken care of by this overturning action arising due to the column forces. So the uh, uh, windward column is subjected to tension and the leeward column is subjected to compression. And due to that, an overturning action is developed that takes care of the rest of the moment. But in reality, our beams have finite stiffness and those are usually connected monolithically with the columns. So the reality is somewhere in between where the beam also deforms. And here we can understand that the moment which we are getting at the base of the columns is somewhere between pH by two and pH by four. So we get in between. And similarly, these reactions will also be uh, somewhere between zero and pH by 2L, which we get in case of uh, a rigid beam. What we take away from this example is that as we are able to mobilize axial action in our structural system, lateral load resistance system, its stiffness and strength will increase. But same is not true for the ductility. The ductility, when the in the presence of axial action, the ductility of the columns reduces. And we uh, take care of that by ensuring that the failure or yielding is occurring in the beams. So that's why we have a strong column weak beam system so that all the ductility is coming from the beams. Ductility of the columns, if we allow the columns to yield, then the ductility is going to reduce in presence of axial force. So that's the problem that when we mobilize axial action in our structural system, the strength and stiffness will increase, but the ductility will reduce and we have to uh, use some measure to achieve the desired uh, amount of ductility. We can extend this further to a brace frame where we provide a diagonal member. And here we can see that the columns and the diagonal member are resisting the whole force more or less through axial action. So here we see only axial action. And here this brace, this diagonal brace is subjected to compression. And irrespective of what slenderness ratio we are taking, when this brace is going to yield, it will buckle. Because after yielding, the effective, effective modulus of elasticity, effective stiffness of this brace will become zero. And as a result, this will have zero buckling capacity post yielding. So we get the post yield buckling. The elastic buckling, which we are familiar, all of us can be taken care of by using a squat member, by reducing the slenderness ratio, the LYR ratio, but we can't avoid post yield or inelastic buckling, which will occur when the plastic hinge is forming and the tangent modulus becomes zero. So as a result of that buckling, the ductility in this case reduces significantly. So this fourth system, which is shown on the screen 
is very efficient in terms of stiffness and strength, but it has very low ductility. So another system has been considered where we can combine the uh, stiffness, strength, and ductility. So here you can see these are the capacity curves, load displacement curve of these two systems. So in the first case, where we have a finite size beam with uh, columns stronger than the beam and the plastic hinges are forming in the beams, we can see that significant ductility is also obtained. But in case of uh, a braced frame, when the brace is subjected to tension, we will get ductility because steel is quite ductile in tension. So we will get uh, ductility when the brace is subjected to tension. So in one direction, we will get good ductility, but in the other direction, it will buckle. And as a result, we are not going to get uh, required ductility. And uh, earthquake, as we know, is a reversible phenomena. The earthquake force changes its direction. So the uh, brace will go alternately in compression and tension. And in compression, it will buckle. And we are not going to get the same strength and ductility in the compression. So this we can avoid or we can enhance the ductility of the brace frame by providing what we call eccentric braces. So here, uh, this is one example of eccentric braces where the braces are applied, uh, braces are connected to the beam at certain eccentricity. And this portion of the beam, which is shown in the red color here, this we call link. And when the earthquake force is applied, let us say towards right direction, these two portions left and right to this link uh, shown in red color, these will try to deform. And as a result, the link is subjected to very high shear stress. And we know that steel is quite ductile even in shear. RCC is not ductile in shear because of concrete, but steel is quite ductile in shear. So in case of eccentrically braced frame, we design this link in such a way that it should yield before buckling of the compression um, uh, brace, because these braces, left side brace will be subjected to tension, right side brace will be subjected to compression, and it will have tendency to buckle if it is yielding. So we do not allow yielding of the brace in this case, rather we ensure that the link yields before uh, yielding of the brace. And as a result, we get good ductility, and at the same time, we get the strength and stiffness of the brace frame. Now, another issue which we have to understand in case of uh, analysis for earthquake force is the behavior of the joints. So here, a two-story portal frame is shown subjected to lateral load by these arrows. And then the shape of the bending moment diagram is shown. This is the shape when we have represented beams and columns by single line. But actually, the beams and columns have some finite size. And as a result, we can see in a column, the bending moment, which is at the top face of the beam, it is, let us say, having tension on the left side. At the bottom face, it is having tension on the right side. So it is changing the direction. So the bending moment changes direction within the column from the uh, top of the beam to the bottom of the beam. And there is a drastic gradient of moment change within the joint. And we know that uh, the gradient, the rate of change of moment is shear force. So as a result, the joint is subjected to very large shear force. And uh, our code, IS13920, has special provisions for ensuring that the joints should not fail under this high shear, the joint should not fail before yielding of beams in flexion. So that is to be ensured. And we have to design our joints for capacity shear arising due to yielding of reinforcement in the beam under reversible earthquake force. Then we all understand uh, commonly used uh, frame and shear wall. The difference between the frame and shear wall is that the frame consists of beams and columns. It is primarily deforming in a shear mode. So frame actually deforms in a shear mode. The base shear at the base is maximum, and at the top, the story shear is close to zero. So as a result, the story sway is maximum at the base, and it goes on reducing towards the top. So we get a deformed shape, which is 
having the maximum uh, rotation or maximum interest to unit drift at the base and the interest to unit drift goes on reducing. The shear wall, it is like a cantilever column. And here, the predominant deformation mode is flexure. And in flexure, we know that the moment is maximum at the base. And as a result, the curvature is maximum at the base. But as the moment goes on reducing towards the top, the curvature also goes on reducing. And rotation, we can get by integrating curvature. So we can see that as we go up, the rotation goes on increasing. The rotation is zero at the base. So although the curvature is maximum at the base, but because of the boundary condition, the rotation is zero. And when we integrate the curvature, we go on adding the curvature along the height, the rotation goes on increasing. The curvature at the top, which is given by the bending of the, um, or the um, radius of bending of the shear wall, so that we can see is zero. So there, there is uh, hardly any curvature uh, at the top because the moment is zero. But what we see here, that the shape of deformation of frame and shear wall is opposite to each other. So when we combine those, there will be an average deformed shape. It will depend upon the combination of the two. And uh, that there will be a, an interaction between the two, what we call frame shear wall interaction. And there will be transfer of forces from shear wall to frame and vice versa. So what happens at the base? The interstory drift in the frame is maximum, whereas in the shear wall, it is minimum. And as a result, at the base, the shear wall is supporting the frame. And at the top, the shear wall is pulling the frame because the frame is having lesser interstory drift and the shear wall has larger interstory drift. So as a result, the shear wall is uh, transferring its force to the frame near the top. So there is a significant transfer of load between frame and shear wall. And this transfer of force between different lateral load resisting frames, either shear walls or shear walls and frames, that takes place through the floor. And as a result, the role of the floor in lateral load becomes very important because our different components may not deform in the same shape. So uh, the distribution will take place from one element to the other, and we have to take care of that distribution through design of the floor slab, and at the same time, the anchorage of the floor slab with later load resisting elements, uh, particularly shear walls. Now, one question is very relevant, uh, which is asked in industry, that when we can say that a column will behave as a shear wall. So at what um, aspect ratio of the cross-section B by D, we can say that uh, uh, the, the column can uh, act like a shear wall. And then we will design and uh, detail that element as shear wall. So actually, this question is not put in the correct uh, context. We cannot decide behavior of a column or a shear wall based on its aspect ratio. It doesn't depend on the aspect ratio. It depends on the overall behavior of that element in the structure, depending on how stiff and rigid the beams and columns connecting that element are. Based on that, we will get a bending moment diagram for the element. So in a column, what I'm showing on the screen, this is the typical bending moment diagram in columns of a frame. So we can see that there is point of contour flexure in each beam near the mid height of the column. Sorry, in each column near the mid height. So each column is subjected to point of contour flexure. The direction of the moment is changing from base to the top. So that is the characteristic bending moment uh, variation in a column. On the right hand side, this is the variation of the bending moment in beams. So the beams are also subjected to varying moment. The ch direction change is taking place, and we are having a point of contour flexure. So in a frame, we will invariably have the point of contour flexure in the columns and beams. So if we are getting this point of contour flexure in our member, it is to be designed and detailed as a column. On the other hand, in case of a shear wall, like the one we see here, so this is the bending moment diagram in the shear wall. So what we see 
that the bending moment is changing suddenly wherever the beams are connected. So where the beams are connected, there will be a change in the bending moment diagram. But overall, it will be like that of a cantilever. So the behavior of the shear wall will be that similar to cantilever. So whether it will act as a shear wall or it will act as a column will depend upon the relative stiffness of the member with respect to the beams getting connected to it. So if it is having a bending moment diagram similar to that of a cantilever, we can design and detail it as a shear wall. And what is the difference? In case of shear wall, we are doing reptile detailing at the base because that's the potential plastic hinge. So the plastic hinge is forming at the base and we do all the confinement and ductile detailing at the base. On the other hand, in case of a column, the plastic hinge can occur at each joint, top and bottom of each column, where we are having the extreme moments. So plastic hinge is possible because of the point of contour flexure, the plastic hinge is possible at top as well as bottom. So that's why in case of columns, the ductile detailing is to be done at top and bottom in all the stories uh, in the column. Whereas in case of shear wall, we can take advantage of this bending moment diagram. And if we are taking the advantage in ductile detailing, we should ensure that the bending moment diagram is like this, that of a cantilever, not like a column, which is having um, uh, points of contour flexure in the middle. Then, as I said, that we can combine the action of shear wall and frame in a coupled shear wall. So coupled shear wall actually has openings arranged vertically. And uh, our 16700 also has a clause. It says that wherever we are providing openings in the uh, shear walls, those openings should be arranged vertically in a line. And um, as a result, the shear wall will act like two shear walls connected with these deep beams, which we call coupling beams. So this coupled shear wall, I can consider as a perforated wall, or I can consider two shear walls interconnected by these coupling beams. And when these shear walls band, subjected to lateral load, these band, okay. So the neutral axis, which is shown earlier in the black color. So we can represent the shear wall using a linear element similar to column. So two types of modeling for shear wall are possible. Either we can use finite element modeling or we can just use the linear frame element. And frame element can be represented by a line along the center of the shear wall. So the two shear walls will be represented by these two vertical elements and the coupling beams will be represented by horizontal beams horizontal frame elements. But we have to understand that the intersection of the beams and columns here is not a point. Rather, it is having a finite size of the joint. And this portion of the beam, which is shown by these rectangles, this will act as a stiff element. And as a result, we will not get bending in this portion of the beam, which is overlapping with the shear wall. So on both the sides, in both the shear walls, half breadth of each shear wall, that is to be treated as rigid. One more thing, this rigid section, which is shown by this rectangle, it is normal to the neutral axis or the centroidal axis in this case. When the shear wall is bending, this section will try to remain plain and normal to the uh, neutral axis. And as a result, we can see there will be large rotation taking place, especially near the top of the shear wall. And this portion of the beam, which is between the shear walls, this will be subjected to large shear deformation. And it is subjected to very high shear deformations. Usually the concrete get crushed. The shear stress, which is developing here, exceeds tau C max. And as a result, the shear stress, uh, the concrete here, gets crushed and our conventional shear reinforcement which works on the principle of uh, frame analogy or truss analogy will not work here. So we have to understand that this coupling beam is subjected to very large shear force and as a result the coupling beams are first 
to get damaged. And once the coupling beams damage, the shear walls tend to become independent, and then the failure will occur at the base of these shear walls. So here we will expect the yielding of reinforcement and crushing of the concrete at the base of the shear walls. So the overall behavior of the system will depend not only on the shear walls, but to a lot of extent on the stiffness, strength, and ductility of these coupling beams. That's why design of coupling beams uh, should receive special attention when we are designing uh, coupled shear walls or the shear walls with openings arranged vertically like this. So we can uh, consider it like this. I have two shear walls, independent, separated from each other. Then the total moment of inertia will be two times T into B. B is the half width or width of one shear wall. So 2 into TB cubed by 12, that is 1, 6 TB cubed. Now, if I combine those, I make the total width as 2B. We understand that the uh, moment of inertia will increase four times. So it will be 4 by 6 TB cubed. Now, our coupled shear walls are somewhere in between. Those are not connected together because to connect them together, I have to uh, make them integrated along this central line. So that I'm not doing, but I'm connecting those through these coupling beams. And as a result, these coupling beams are transferring shear force from one shear wall to the other shear wall. And the moment of inertia is somewhere, the effective moment of inertia is somewhere between these two extreme cases. In one case, the shear wall is totally separated. In other case, the shear wall is integrated together. So connection through these coupling beams will render the shear walls or the coupled shear wall somewhere in between. So this enhances the stiffness and strength as well as ductility of the shear wall tremendously, but the coupling beams need a special design. So the bending moment diagram in the two shear walls will be something like this, although these are connected by coupling beams. So due to these coupling beams, there will be a sharp change at the level, at each story level where the coupling beams are connected, but still the shape of the bending moment diagram in the shear walls will be that of uh, similar to a cantilever. And the potential location of the plastic hinge in the shear wall is at the base, not at the intermediate levels. Now modeling of shear walls, we can do either using finite element or using white column analogy or uh, what we discussed just now, the frame element. So a non-planar shear wall also, I can model as a frame element. So the right side is quite uh, intuitive in uh, using finite element method. I can model the shear walls of any shape. The problem with finite element modeling is that usually it provides us distribution of stresses. And our design is based on design of a section for axial force, bending moment, and shear force. So we have to integrate the shear forces, oh, sorry, in, integrate the stresses in the finite element model to get the axial force, bending moment, and shear force. Most of the software has that uh, facility already available where you can define a section or you can define peers and uh, spandrels, and it will uh, integrate the uh, stresses along the cross-section of piers and spandrels, and you can get the stress resultants, moments, force, axial force, and shear force, and you can design for that. But care is to be taken if we are not uh, selecting the piers and spandrels correctly, then the design will be erroneous. The uh, equivalent frame model, or what we call column analogy, is relatively simple, where each planar portion of the shear wall is represented by one frame element in the vertical direction. And these are interconnected through each, to each other through these rigid elements. So these horizontal ones, these are the rigid elements. And the vertical ones, these are the frame elements, uh, which are having the properties of the shear wall. And this will also capture the behavior of the non-planar shape of the shear wall. So this is 
easy to interpret the results are easier to interpret and at the same time the degrees of freedom are much less in finite element model when we are modeling a really tall building the size of the shear wall will be so large and the number of degrees of freedom will be very large it will be very difficult to analyze this equivalent frame model is relatively easy because the degrees of freedom are smaller and it is easier to also interpret the results here i have taken an example where even a uh, shear wall core can be modeled using uh, equivalent frame method or uh, what we call the frame or uh, um, column analogy so uh, what we have here these vertical members these are representing the three shear walls portions so we can see in each shear wall each side of the shear wall there is there are two two uh, planar portions in the longitudinal direction and one planar portion in the transverse direction so each of these three shape portion will be represented by three vertical elements so in elevation i have shown one similar is at the back of it and then there is in the perpendicular direction also then the two c shape shear walls are connected by coupling beams so these coupling beams are forming due to openings in the shear wall core so we have openings in the shear wall cores and as a result we will have these coupling beams so coupling beams are shown here and these uh, darker lines thicker lines these are representing the rigid beams so rigid elements are connected to the shear walls or different portions of the shear walls and also to the coupling beams so this way we can um, develop a model of even a shear wall core using uh, frame analogy and again the advantage is that the interpretation interpretation of the results for design is easier is simpler and uh, we require much less number of degrees of freedom then another issue which is at the moment not covered in our code is the capacity design of shear walls we talk about capacity design of beams we design uh, columns for capacity design we protect the capacity design of the columns we also do capacity design of joints but similar capacity design is also needed for shear walls which is currently missing in our code and in capacity design actually what we are doing is that we are preventing the undesired modes of failure so we uh, provide hierarchy of strength in such a way that the capacity of undesired modes of failure is protected and the failure occurs in the desired mode in case of a shear wall the desired failure mode is flexural failure at the base we don't want the flexural failure to occur at a middle story the reason for that is that if flexural failure will occur in a middle story for the same amount of curvature ductility or rotational ductility we will get less displacement ductility and the energy dissipation will be less so what we want we want to limit the yielding to the base and that we have to ensure that the uh, um, shear uh, sorry the moment capacity of the upper portion of the shear wall should be more than what demand it is going to have when the bottom portion of the shear wall is yielding then we also want to avoid the shear failure of the shear walls because shear failure in rcc is brittle and we have to ensure that the shear wall is designed with adequate shear strength so that it does not fail in shear so for this purpose we design the shear wall for the analyzed uh, demand which we are getting from our analysis we design for that but we understand that the moment capacity which we are providing will be invariably higher than what is coming from the um, analysis and from our limited state design one of the reasons is that we usually provide more steel than required but even if we are providing steel as per requirement exactly as per requirement we are using a factor of safety and we use characteristic strength and due to that the actually provided strength the plastic strength which we are providing is higher than what we are uh, obtaining from the analysis and the actual moment distribution or bending moment diagram when the bottom is yielding will be something like this what is shown here 
curve. So this is what we have to consider in our design. So if we are providing additional capacity at the base, we have to keep in mind, we have to enhance the capacity of the shear wall in the upper portion also. Otherwise, it will have failure wherever the demand to capacity ratio is maximum. So shear wall is not going to yield at the location of maximum demand. Rather, it will yield if due to any reason we are enhancing the capacity at the base, we have to enhance the capacity in the top portion also in such a way that it is not yielding before yielding of course. So what we are getting from analysis is this BUCS, but actually what we will get corresponding to this moment capacity of MPR, that is this BE. So we have to modify our shear force diagram also, taking into account the capacity provided at the base. So whatever shear force will develop when the shear wall is uh, yielding at the base, that we have to provide here. And the moment capacity, we can obtain the design moment capacity, we can obtain uh, using this equation. So here the shear force for which we are designing will be capital omega V, small omega V, VU. VU is the design uh, shear force and it should be less than or equal to 3 VU. It need not to be more than three times what we are getting from the analysis. But up to three times it is possible. And the value of omega V, capital omega V and the small omega V, capital omega V is representing the over strength, which we are providing additional strength and this additional strength is simply the ratio of the moment capacity provided. MPR is the capacity and MU is the demand. So it is the capacity to demand, but it should not be less than 1.5. As per ACI 318, it should be at least 1.5. So we have to enhance the capacity at least 1.5 times when HW by LW, that is the aspect ratio of the shear wall greater than 1.5. HW by LW greater than 1.5, what does it indicate is that the shear wall is governed by flexure. It is a slender shear wall. Its behavior will be governed by flexure. And in that case, the overstrength capacity will be governed by the moment capacity. But when HW by LW is less than 1.5, then the shear wall behavior or failure of the shear wall is governed by shear. So shear failure, it is a squared shear wall, low rise shear wall. So in tall buildings, this is not the case. Mostly this is the first case. And we have to take omega V. And the small omega V, we can, this depends upon the dynamic characteristics of the building, uh, how tall the building is. So it depends upon the number of stories. So small omega V is to be based upon the number of stories. And once we calculate capital omega V and small omega V, we have to calculate this enhanced shear capacity VE. And we have to plot a shear force diagram, which is similar to the original shear force diagram, but is scaled by this ratio of VECS and VUCS. And we have to design for this shear capacity so that the shear wall does not fail in shear when the plastic hinge is forming at the base of the shear wall in fracture. So we want the shear wall to yield in fracture and that too at the base. That can be ensured by this capacity design method. And currently this uh, guideline is missing in our code, IS 13920 as well as IS 16700. So I thought I should share with you. Now, what has been observed that not only the capacity, moment capacity we are providing usually is higher than what is coming from the analysis, when the plastic hinge forms at the base, the deflected shape of the shear wall changes and the bending moment diagram changes. And it has been observed that the bending moment diagram in the bottom portion becomes constant. So what Mohile has suggested, and it has been suggested by other pupils also, uh, like Tisple, he has suggested that post yielding, when the yielding occurs at the base of the shear wall, its shape of bending moment diagram changes. And the what is given currently, even in ACI 318, that is also not safe enough. What is suggested is that we should extend the bending moment at the base 
up to a critical height and beyond critical height it will follow the same curve which was here and it is amplified by this fact so we can see that this mu dash this was obtained from the envelope from aci 318 that should be multiplied by this phi not and phi not is the uh, ratio of the moment at the base so this envelope which is shown here actually this should be used to design the uh, shear walls to avoid formation of the plastic hinges along the height to ensure that the plastic hinge forms at the base only then in shear walls we use different types of foundation system and different combinations with uh, the basements and there are some zones which are subjected to very high shear force these uh, zones we call panel zone it is similar to the panel zones which we are having in columns when we are connecting steel columns with beams we get very high shear in the joint something similar happens here only thing is that here the size of this panel zone is much larger it is of the same width or same length as the shear wall so this panel zone as we can see here this is subjected to very large shear force the uh, top slab which we know as back stay at the top of the basement it is subjected to large axial force and it is transferring that force to the shear wall or rather it is supporting the shear wall here and as a result the shape of the bending moment diagram in the shear wall changes suddenly and as a result this portion of the shear wall is subjected to very large shear force and this need special detailing the, in this portion we have to check the reinforcement for this high amount of the shear and that high amount of shear we can calculate using the tension and compressive uh, forces which are acting uh, which are occurring at the two ends of the shear wall and either we can provide this type of rectangular uh, pattern or we can have reinforcement as shown here using strut and tie method so that the panel zone has adequate shear strength so this is another missing point in our code our code does not provide adequate uh, guidelines about designing this panel zone so we have to take care of this also moile in his book Uh, th this is relatively recent book uh, by Moile on design of RCC buildings, and he has very nicely uh, covered this, including the method of calculation of the shear capacity and shear demand. Then another system, which is an improvement of shear wall, is this core and outrigger system. So we understand that if a shear wall is connected to the frame through the beams and slab. both will deform together so they will have same shape the shape will be somewhere in between the two as we discussed that the frame has a different shape and the shear wall has a different shape and shear wall will act uh, will deform like a cantilever and its uh, center line will have a deformation like this so let us assume that the center line is this uh, here or uh, the neutral axis is here and uh, any section which is perpendicular to this neutral axis will remain perpendicular even after bending so it it will occupy this position this orientation and the beams here will deform but somehow if i extend this rigid portion towards both the ends we can understand that in that case the columns will be subjected to very high axial force and the axial action of the columns will be mobilized so in the first case the columns are primarily subjected to bending action whereas in the second case the columns are subjected to very large axial force also and as i explained if we are able to mobilize the axial force in the columns or um, in any other member like brace then the stiffness and the strength or efficiency of this little load resisting system gets enhanced but there is problem of ductility because when columns are subjected to high axial force their ductility is compromised so we have to take into account the ductility so where our design is governed by let us say bin or interstory drift where stiffness is crucial forces are not 
that big an issue, then we can easily go for this system where the response reduction factor will be compromised, that, that may be reduced, but at the same time, we are getting high stiffness. So different examples of this core and outrigger systems uh, have been used world over. Just a few I have shown here, just to show the representative. So in the center, this gray color, that is our core. And outside perimeter, these are our columns. So idea is to mobilize or to attach the columns with the shear wall in such a way that when this shear wall core is bending, the column tries to follow the deformed shape of the um, shear wall. And this can be achieved by providing these deep horizontal beams. So generally these deep horizontal beams, these are also one story deep. And these are also uh, similar to the shear wall, the planar uh, elements. And these are connecting the shear wall to these columns. Different arrangements are possible. Here, steel connectors have been used. Steel collector elements are used where the columns are connected to the shear wall through these red color uh, steel members. And these steel members will act like braces. And uh, as we discussed that the braces are quite stiff. So these will mobilize the axial force here. But as I said that the problem is ductility. So some efforts have been made where these uh, steel members, these diagonal steel members, these are allowed to yield. These are designed in such a way that these will fail during earthquake. And in that process, these will dissipate energy. Or we can have energy dissipating devices like dampers between connected between these outriggers and the columns. And when the relative movement between these outriggers and the columns will take place, the energy dissipation device will be activated and it will dissipate energy. So we have to keep in mind when we are adding stiffness and strength through these outriggers, the ductility is compromised, the energy dissipation in our structure is compromised, and we have to enhance that by making some alternative arrangement. Another system which is used for tall buildings, so usually buildings greater than 40 story have tubular system in some way or the other. So as we discussed in the beginning, the frame tube system consists of four frames or more number of frames in such a way that it forms a closed tube, which is hollow from inside. So uh, we have four frames on the four sides and in the middle portion of the building, in the central portion of the building, there is no lateral load adjusting columns. There may be some columns here, which we will design as gravity columns but all the little load resisting columns are put along the perimeter. And as a result, these columns are quite close. Uh, spacing, usual spacing is of the order of three meters. Similarly, the beams connecting these columns are also quite deep. Again, one meter. So typical size is something like one meter by one meter. So we can think it as a tube, a closed tube having perforations for windows. So within that three meter uh, bay width and story height, one meter by one meter is taken care of by the columns on each side. So space remaining between uh, the beams and columns is two meter by two meter, which can be utilized for windows. So we can treat this as a uh, tube made of RCC wall with perforations for windows, or we can consider it as a system consisting of beams and columns large columns interconnected by deep spandrel beams and those columns are closely spaced so that the shear transfer between them can take place efficiently. Perfect. And there are some deformations in these beams and as a result, there is some leakage of the axial force from one column to the other. For example, in this case, suppose we are applying a lateral force in this direction, then the frame which is along the lateral load direction, we call it back, and the frame perpendicular to it is called flange. And when the shear wall, oh, sorry, this uh, building is subjected to this loading, the flange will be subjected to 
uh, or in ideal condition, it should have been subjected to uniform axial force in the columns. Whereas in the bar, it is uh, it should have had linear distribution with uh, the column near the center having zero axial force, and on the right side it will have tension. Uh, sorry, compression, and left side it should have tension. But the real distribution of axial force is not like this. It is something like this. So where in the frame where it was supposed to be uniform, actually it is non-uniform, and the center. Central columns are subjected to less axial force as compared to the column axial force. Similarly, in the back, it should have been linear, but it is not linear. It is following. A curve. Distribution in idea not valid here. Those or those plane sections distort those plane sections warp and as a result we have this type of distribution in the bottom portion of the um, uh, frame tube and this behavior we call shear lag so uh, systems even in case of steel section when we are using for structural steel when we have an i section or c section the distribution of the stresses in the flange is not uniform due to this shear lag action and same thing happens here so the columns near the center are not fully utilized and that's why it is suggested including is16700 it is suggested the size than the interior columns because then we are going to get a better efficiency of the two twin towers which are no more the world trade center so these are the classical examples, although it is in steel, but the system can also be constructed. In, so many tall buildings, world's tallest buildings have this concept of frame tube in some way or other. Another extension of this frame tube is tube in tube system. So where we have outer tube made of um, frames and inner tube made of shear wall. So in a tall building, we have a large service core. So service core can be enclosed with shear wall. And as a result, we get inner core consisting of shear wall, whereas the outer tube is uh, made of frame. And it is something similar to frame shear wall dual system. Similar type of interaction also take place. And at the same time, that uh, uh, shear lag effect results in reduction in the efficiency of the tube. Another possibility, especially in case of steel frame tubes, is combining the truss section. So this is something called a mega truss. It is different than the brace frame. So here several stories of the frame tube are connected with a mega brace, large size brace, so that the whole system acts like a vertical truss. And it combines the efficiency of frame tube and the truss, and we can achieve further heights. Especially in case of taller buildings, the problem is satisfaction of interstory drift. So drift becomes the governing criteria. And to satisfy the drift criteria, these systems are uh, quite useful. We can also achieve the similar type of behavior in shear walls by providing these RCC panels in such a way to have a similar pattern. Uh, but it is more common in case of steel uh, frame tubes, where the diagonal members can be easily provided then to reduce the shear lag effect, we can have multiple webs as the number of webs is increasing because at the web location, the columns will be subjected to the maximum force. The columns will be utilized fully. Whereas away from the webs, the columns will not be utilized fully. The actual force will reduce. So the efficiency of the system will automatically increase if we, we increase the number of webs. So here we are providing more number of webs resulting in multiple tubes bundled together. That's why it is called multi-cell tube or bundled tube also. Just to check, I hope uh, everything is OK. Uh, my signal is connected, my network is connected, and you are able to hear me. Yes, yes. everything is fine. OK, thank you. Now, um, in literature, some optimal height 
of these different structural systems is uh, given. So depending on the height, we should choose a system which is most optimum in that range. Theoretically, I can go any height with frame also. Only thing is that the size of the beams and columns will go on increasing and it may not be a very efficient system. But uh, some of you may be knowing that Taipei 101, one of the tallest buildings before Burj Khalifa, that, that was the tallest building. Or maybe uh, before that, there was another, that Patronas Towers. So it is one of the tallest buildings of the world. It is having so-called mega frame system. So it is made from frame. So theoretically, it is possible to go any height with any system. But the efficiency of the system will go on reducing as we go on increasing the height because the frames are not having that much stiffness as the brace frame or shear walls. So here the structural systems in steel are compared. So first one is the semi-rigid frame. Then we have rigid frame, which can go up to, let us say, 30 story. Then we have uh, frames with uh, shear truss or what we call braced frames. And you can see here, eccentrically braced frames have been used because we also want the ductility to be available. This is uh, uh, that uh, uh, braced frame with outrigger, so core and outrigger system. So these horizontal trusses, these are acting as outrigger and the central uh, brace system that is acting like a core. Then here in C type system, we have placed most of the lateral load resisting columns along this C shape or this in this I shape. And we understand as we put more and more uh, lateral load resisting material away from the center of the building, the efficiency increases because the effective moment of inertia increases. Then we have here the frame tube system. In frame tube system, we have closely spaced frames along the perimeter. Inside the building, we have only a few columns, those two to take care of the gravity load. This is the multi-cell tube. And here we have the trust tube. So the tallest structures can be constructed by combining the frame tube and the truss. Similar, uh, guidelines are also available in case of RCC buildings. So in RCC buildings, we have frame, then we have a shear wall, then we have combination of frame and shear walls, then we have frame tube, tube with tube, and modular or bundled tube or multi-cell tube. Those are also called modular tube. And, and we can achieve these heights. Uh, this data is some the RCC has been shown up to 80 stories, but more than 80 stories have been achieved in RCC now, in RCC also. So it is only a guideline for optimal selection of the uh, structural system. As such, there is no theoretical limitation on which system cannot be used beyond a particular uh, height. We can use any system up to any height. Only thing is, that the design may not be optimal. We have to provide more material. Whereas in IS 16700, you are familiar, the upper limits for different structural systems have been provided. So all the tall buildings uh, and definition of the tall buildings, we know more than 50 meters are the tall buildings. So in case of uh, tall buildings in zone three and two, we can provide frames, but zone four and five, the frames are not permitted. Then we have well distributed structural walls. So here it is talking about well distributed structural walls, not the shear wall core. So it looks like that the code, although it is not clear anywhere, but it looks like that the code avoids the uh, concentration of the shear wall at the core. So the system having one service core and the rest of it frame that perhaps is avoided in 16700 indicates in that direction. And the reason for that is that when we are providing shear wall core at the center, we get adequate stiffness. So lateral story drift may be satisfied, but the building will be torsionally flexible. So the requirement of torsional mode being the third mode, not the first and second mode, that is indicator of building being torsionally flexible, that cannot be satisfied. And that's why the code has said 
that the shear wall should be distributed. That means the shear wall should be placed away from the center also, so that the torsional stiffness can be mobilized. But we have um, like structural walls and perimeter frame. Uh, it is not clear what does that mean. So here it is uh, understood when they are saying perimeter frame and structural walls means the walls are provided near the core or is it indicating shear wall core? It is not clear, but we can go for uh, perimeter frame and shear wall core also. Then we have a structural wall plus frame tube. So this is tube and tube system and uh, the maximum height up to 250 meters is allowed in this structural system. But theoretically, as far as I understand, there should not be any limit on the number of stories. You have to properly design it. You have to ensure that the building is not torsionally flexible and it satisfies the interest story drift requirement. But currently, the situation is that the code is restricting the maximum height of stru different structural systems in different zones. Then the slenderness ratio is also uh, controlled in the building, in the uh, tall building code 16700. So the slenderness ratio, uh, as it is obvious in seismic zone and uh, zone four and five, the slender buildings are not allowed. Whereas in case of zone two and three, relatively slender value, uh, slender buildings, we can go. Now, the slenderness governs the behavior of the superstructure. That is one thing. Slenderness also governs the behavior of the foundations because if the uh, foot, then the pile, which we are using to support the building. Building. Some of those may go in time. Internal modes of vibration has been a code that the first two modes should be translational modes, either in longitudinal or transverse direction, and the third mode only should be torsional mode. So torsional mode should not be first and second mode. And not only that, the torsional mode should be at least 10%, uh, the period in torsional mode should be at least 10% lower than the uh, shortest uh, torsional mode out of T1 and T2, whichever is shorter, it should be, it should not be more than 0.9 times of that. And another requirement in the code is that the T1, the most flexible mode should not have period greater than eight seconds. It should be either less than or equal to eight seconds. This is to ensure that the building is not very flexible in the transverse direction. So as the building becomes more and more flexible, we know that our square force will reduce, but the instability problems, period type facts will increase and very flexible buildings are to be avoided, to be controlled. And the code has this limitation that the period should be less than eight seconds. Then, Another important issue, which is not dealt with clearly in our code, or rather, which is not dealt with almost uh, at all, is the role of the uh, floor diaphragm. So generally, our understanding and the practice in the, our industry is that the floor is checked for vertical load. The slab is designed for vertical load. But in tall buildings, especially where large base shears are acting, the floor has another important role and that is distributing earthquake force from the point of action to the point of resistance. So earthquake force acts because it is inertia force, it acts on each mass particle. So wherever there is mass, the earthquake force will be generated and it is registered by stiffer elements. So those stiffer elements are shear walls and the lateral load resisting frames. So we know in ACI 318 and now in our code also, there is a concept that some of the frames we declare as lateral load resisting frames and some other frames we design as the gravity frames. So lateral uh, load resisting frames will be much stiffer as compared to gravity frame. Gravity frame are relatively flexible, much flexible. 
so much flexible that those are not attracting significant lateral load because lateral force is distributed in proportion to the stiffness so all the force is to be registered by these stiffer elements either lateral load resisting frames or shear force and this inertia force is being generated throughout the building so it is transferred by these floor slabs and roof slab to these rigid elements and the diaphragm action of these floor slabs is important the diaphragm action means in plane action so these are not only subjected to outer plane forces due to gravity load these are subjected to very high in plane forces especially in case of tall buildings so that behavior also needs to be considered and this is particularly important in case of buildings with podiums and basement so that's why i want to emphasize on this in our today's talk so the force is being generated everywhere but it is being transferred to the uh, lateral load resisting elements shear walls or lateral load resisting uh, frames now um, the force which is acting everywhere that gets transferred through this slab and these elements are taking the force to the base and the slab will span or it will be subjected to bending in its own plane and this distribution is important not only for earthquake force even in case of wind load because wind load will act on the projected surface and it will be registered by the in plane lateral load resisting elements like this and the wind force is has also to be uh, transferred or has to flow through this slab so the diaphragm action of the slab is not only important in case of earthquake it is also important for wind load and even if the wind loads are governing the diaphragm should be checked for the type of forces and stresses it will be subjected to and especially look at this top of the uh, basement here so from the building the force gets transferred to the base of the building and from here it gets transferred to the retaining walls why because the retaining walls are much stiffer even compared to the shear wall which we are having in the tower portion the stiffness of these retaining walls is much larger their length is much larger height is smaller so stiffness of these shear walls is much larger actually these retaining walls are acting like fixed condition so suddenly at this level at the top most floor of the basement there is transfer of the lateral force from the shear wall or the uh, lateral load resisting frames to the retaining walls and that takes place through the diaphragm action of this topmost floor and behavior in plane behavior of this topmost floor becomes very important and this floor we call back stay and this transfer we call back stay effect and this back stay effect has two uh, concerns one is that the bending moment diagram in our uh, shear wall is going to change drastically here because of this transfer of the force to other elements so the shape of the bending moment diagram in our shear walls we have to take into account and the in plane action of this slab becomes important in case of a major earthquake this diaphragm is subjected to such large force that it will crack it may yield and the steel inside this diaphragm that will be subjected to large tension so that steel may yield and as a result its stiffness will vary and when that stiffness reduces we understand the transfer of the force will be less and as a result the bending moment diagram in my shear wall is going to uh, change so the shape of the bending moment diagram in my shear wall not only depends on this back stay effect but it also depends on the relative stiffness of this floor with respect to the shear wall or lateral load resisting elements
So that's why the court asked to perform a sensitivity analysis because the stiffness, first of all, it is uh, variable, it is, uh, it is uncertain, it is difficult to obtain the exact uh, estimation of the uh, stiffness of the slab. Secondly, it is very enduring earthquake. As the damage will occur, as the cracking will occur, the stiffness will go on reducing. So we have to consider two extreme conditions. In one case, when the slab is having little cracking or it is more or less intact. And in the second case, when it is subjected to significant cracking. So that sensitivity analysis we have to perform. Then the portion of the slab near the shear walls, this is, is also having a very important role because whatever force is accumulated on the diaphragm that is transferred to the shear wall through the connection of the floor with the shear wall. So if this connection is not strong enough, the force will not be transferred. And this force transfer takes place through a small width of the slab, part of which is common, is coinciding with the shear wall, and part of which is beyond also. So in this strip, whatever uh, reinforcement is there, that reinforcement is participating in transferring the earthquake force to the shear wall. And this portion we call collector. Sometimes we provide a beam here in some cases. So we can call it a collector beam or collector element. Sometimes it may be just the floor slab, but this portion of the slab close to the shear wall, this also needs a special attention because it is transferring the force to the shear wall. Now the behavior of uh, uh, floor slab, we can understand from this exaggerated example where there is a long slab and there are shear walls at the end. In between, it is supported on columns. So we understand that the stiffness of shear wall is much more than that of the columns or beam column frame. And it is almost supported at the end. We can ignore the literal stiffness of these frames. In that case, what will happen? The whole frame is subjected to lateral force. If we assume the acceleration to be constant, then it will be subjected to uniform lateral force. And under this uniform lateral force, this is going to deform. And the deformation will be such at the ends, it will be equal to the deformation of the shear wall, but in between, it will increase. And this maximum deformation at the center is going to be much more because this floor slab or roof slab will act as a very deep beam in its own plane. And it will have the deformation here. And whether it can be treated as flexible or rigid will depend upon the ratio of this delta max and delta wall. So delta wall is the deformation of the support. And delta max is sum of the two. It includes the delta wall as well as the deformation of the slab. And uh, in all courts of the world, the Rigid diaphragm is defined in terms of the limit on delta max by delta wall. Our code, IS 1893, also defines this limit. Now, when the force is acting like this, we have seen that our um, um, diaphragm, the slab, will act as a beam. It will be subjected to compression at one side and tension on the other side. So for this, we should have continuous reinforcement provided at the two edges of this slab so that it can sustain that much bending moment which will be occurring. Uh, we understand that the depth here is very large. Actually, the width of the slab is its depth in diaphragm action. So the depth is very large in diaphragm action, but the width, which is thickness of the slab, that is small. So we need to provide adequate reinforcement. If we are having perimeter beam, if suppose we are having a frame running along the perimeter and a beam running along the perimeter, then we will have adequate reinforcement from that beam. But if we do not have a perimeter beam, then we have to be extra careful for checking that the reinforcement in the tension and compression cord is adequate to take care of the, take care of the uh, forces. And we, that we can obtain simply using the beam theory, like we are designing our RCC beam. Same way we, we can calculate the tension reinforcement required. So in the transverse direction, the beam is acting like a, a simply supported or um, continuous 
depending on how many little load elements we have it will act like a beam and as a result at the center we are going to get the maximum moment and there we uh, can calculate how much reinforcement is required then when where the slab is getting connected to the shear wall this portion is also important the force from the slab is transferred to the shear wall we can see that the length of the shear wall is less than the width of the slab in this case so the connection of the slab is not over the whole length of the slab the connection is only in this length so the force from the slab will be transferred to this shear wall through the interface where they are uh, sharing the common perimeter here it will transfer but from the slab it will also get transferred through this strip which we can call collector element or collector spread into slab so this much portion of the slab should transfer and we can see how the transfer is taking place so if the force is acting downward as shown here so in this portion the slab and the reinforcement will be subjected to compression in this portion the reinforcement will be subjected to torsion and in between the force transfer will take place through direct shear so it is shear transfer here it is tensile force and compressive force and some of the three forces should be equal to the total force which we are applying or which the slab is subjected to uh, during earthquake or uh, wind for that matter and the width of this effective width of this collector element can be taken from the center if i draw a line at an angle of 45 degree from the normal wherever it intersects the boundary that much portion of the slab can be considered effective we know slab in any case is provided reinforcement in both the directions for bending the same reinforcement can act as collector reinforcement as well and we have to ensure that this reinforcement provided here and sometimes it may be required to provide a larger number of bars closer bars near the intersection with the shear wall so that it is ensured that the shear force can get transferred from slab to the shear wall this will be much more critical when we will talk about the back stress slab for example here so here we have the retaining walls and this is the shear wall of the tower the shear wall is subjected to lateral force let us say towards right direction and all that force will transfer through this strip of the back stay and it should not be only rigid enough it should have adequate strength also otherwise there may be local yielding in the slab surrounding this shear wall and the back stay effect will be lost and the result of that loss of back stay effect will be that the bending moment in the shear wall in the basement portion will increase tremendously so here again we can consider this bit the effective which is which we can obtain in the same way taken an angle of 45 degree from the normal we can decide that how much width on each side is going to participate in transfer of this lateral load now uh, the same behavior is shown here we may have a beam also at the floor level along the perimeter so the force from the slab will flow to the shear wall through this beam and also part of the slab near to the shear wall so that portion we need to check for the adequacy of reinforcement now how we can ensure this currently our code tries to take this into account indirectly so it says that it uh, governs the minimum stiffness of rcc in uh, the slabs so it says that for um, any slab precast or um, when we are using composite slab systems the minimum rcc spread is creed should be at least 75 mm in zone 4 and 5 and it depends on the zone because the force being transferred through the diaphragm will also depend on the zone that's why in zone 3 4 and 5 larger thickness is required and in zone 2 relatively smaller thickness is allowed then the code avoids these uh, cutouts in the slab so if the cutout is at the corner it is not allowed 
at, at our core. Because if we are having any later load resisting element along the boundary, the force transfer cannot take place. The force from the point of application to the little load resisting element cannot take place because here our slab is discontinuous. Openings, small openings are allowed, but those openings should not be near the boundary. And those should be small. And the size has to be less than 30% of the area of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm area, if it is 80, the diaphragm, uh, sorry, the area of the opening can be only 30% of that. And then there is also limit on its uh, distance from the boundary. So this W1 and W2, this should be greater than five meter. W1 and W2 both should be greater than two meter. And W1 and W2 together should be more than half the width of the slab. So in no case, the opening size should be more than 50% of the diaphragm. So our code tries to take this indirectly into account. But that is not adequate, especially in case of the back stress slab. There we should check, we should model the slab using finite element and we should calculate the forces and stresses and we should provide adequate thickness and reinforcement to take care of those uh, forces. So other slabs above uh, the back stay in tower portion, we can even model using uh, rigid diaphragm command, but the back stay slab should not be modeled using uh, uh, rigid slab command, rigid diaphragm command. We should model it using uh, finite element and we should calculate the forces and stresses occurring in the back stay. So two important components in case of uh, tall buildings are podium and back stay. So podium is a portion, a lower part of the building, which is larger in the size. The floor plate size is larger, but it is not having larger stiffness. Mostly the stiffness of the podium, the distribution of the stiffness is more or less same as that of the tower portion. Only the size can be larger. If the podium is having, let us say, another rigid core or shear wall, then its behavior will be different. Its behavior will be more like that of the basement. So in that case, we have to consider the uh, slabs between the podium portion also as back stick. But if the podium is having, let us say, only columns, only its size is more, then the podium above the portion of the podium, above the ground level is not of much concern. That can be modeled along with the tower and it can be considered along with the tower. So the other issue is this back stay. So mostly this back stay uh, effect is occurring when our tower is constructed on basement. And in that case, the top slab of the basement, which is at the ground level, that is subjected to excessive forces. And it changes the shear force and bending moment in the um, tower or podium if uh, the podium is extending beyond the basement. So this portion, we need to take a special care. Now, how does this uh, back stay effect comes into picture. So here we have a tower in the central portion and it is subject to, it, it is having some basement. So as the basement consists of retaining walls, which also act as shear walls along the perimeter, it is very rigid and it is further supported by soil. So even if it is not supported by soil, even if we ignore the stiffness by soil, the stiffness of those retaining walls itself is such that this bottom portion becomes very rigid. Now, above the basement, suppose this podium uh, was continuing above this, generally the shear walls will not be continuing. It will be consisting of only beam column frames. In that case, that portion of the podium can be designed and modeled along with the tower itself. So though that portion, which is having suddenly increased stiffness, very high stiffness due to the retaining walls, that portion is of concern. And wherever that portion starts, that means the topmost floor or what we call man, sorry, main back stay. So that there, 
the lot of reaction develops here and as a result the bending moment and shear force in the tower portion gets changed significantly so if we have a tower and basement separated from each other then we can understand that the tower will deform in this form it will vibrate about the foundation and when we are calculating its period then the height should be taken from the base as it is also explained in is 1893 so in this case when we have separated through expansion joint the basement portion and the tower portion the tower is to be designed as if the base is at the foundation level and the basement portion is to be designed separately it is to be considered separately but here we are not making use of these rigid retaining walls which are available to us in any case so it's better it's more efficient if we can connect the towers with the basement portion and when we do this at this level at the top floor level of the basement the when the tower tries to deform the back stay slab prevents that and as a result there is a couple acting in the basement portion of the building which is uh, counteracting the applied overturning moment so the bending moment diagram we can think it like this the deform shape is plotted here so this is the deform shape and this portion acts like a pin support here at the back stay level so applied force here it has been assumed uh, triangular linearly varying along the height this is the deform shape shear force diagram will be like this at this location there will be change in the direction of the shear force because very high shear force is acting here and the shape of the bending moment diagram will be like this and the maximum bending moment in the tower portion will occur at the back stay level at the top of the basement this behavior real behavior can be simulated like this the tower can be simulated from its base and depending on the foundation we are providing there will be a rotational restraint we assume either pinned or fixed but those are only the ideal condition neither it is pinned nor it is fixed especially when we are talking about tall building actually there will be um, some flexibility here some rotation can occur here and similarly the back stay that is also not infinitely rigid it will also have some stiffness so the back stay along with the the retaining walls which act as shear walls so that has its own stiffness and both these stiffnesses are uncertain we have difficulty in exactly estimating these because estimating the stiffness of the back stay along with the shear walls retaining walls and uh, soil is difficult and similarly estimating the rotational stiffness of the foundation at the base that is also difficult so we should try to estimate those as exactly as possible but what the code says that we can do a um, sensitivity analysis and in sensitivity analysis we consider an upper bound and lower bound stiffness of the back stay and depending on that upper bound and lower bound stiffness we will get the bending moments in our uh, tower portion and the basement now if the podium is also having another stiff element here like another shear wall then the transfer between the transfer of the shear force between the two towers will also take place between the two shear walls will also take place and this element which is uh, at the top of the podium this is subjected to large in plane forces its behavior is also similar to the back stay so we can call it as collector or secondary back stay but its behavior will be very similar to the back stay and in this case we have to model this these floors of the podium also using finite elements so we can model the floors above the podium top using uh, rigid diaphragm but below that we have to model those floors using uh, using uh, finite element so that we get 
the effect of these. Now, in place, in case of basement, the location where the plastic hinge usually will take place and which is the desired location is this. So the plastic hinge formation will take place here. So this portion needs to be detailed very carefully. So in our shear wall within the tower, the plastic hinge will not take place at the base of the shear wall. Rather, it will take place just adjacent to the back strip. If it is a coupled shear wall, then in coupled shear wall also, the yielding in the shear wall will take place just above this back strip. Now, when we have to analyze tower and basement together, there is a problem. And the problem is that the basement portion is quite rigid. It has a lot of mass, and at the same time, it is very rigid. So when we do dynamic analysis of this using mode superposition, we see that the uh, modes which we obtain, we are not getting contribution from the basement. It is very difficult to excite the basement. And most of the times, it is very difficult to obtain 90% mass participation when we are making the full model of the structure. Because the bottom portion being rigid gets excited only in higher modes. So if I have to consider the 90% mass participation for the whole structure, I have to go the number of modes in terms of hundreds, 200 or 300 modes, depending on the size of the building are required. Then only I will be able to excite the full structure. Okay. Then another issue is that when I'm comparing it with the codal method uh, for VB bar by VB correction, which height I should consider, whether I should take the full height or I should take the height above this. And when I'm taking height only above the basement, with which base shear I have to compare that base shear should be at the ground level or the base shear should be at the base level. So we can understand it like this, that the same building we can analyze like this. The tower portion I can analyze, assuming it to be fixed at the back stair level, at the top of the basement, I can analyze this. So this I'm analyzing, I can perform dynamic analysis, mode superposition using fixed base at the back stair level. And as a result, I will get the axial forces, bending moment, and shear force in all the elements at the base of the tower portion, that is at the back stable. So these forces I can calculate from dynamic analysis. And uh, the base shear in this portion, I will scale with what I'm getting from the code. So the scaling of the base shear is to be done for this. Then I can analyze the basement portion separately, subjected to these forces, which I'm getting from the tower portion, and also the inertia force, which is acting due to its own motion. So this is subjected to earthquake motion inside the ground. And as a result, this is also subjected to lateral forces. Those lateral forces can be obtained statically, but being rigid, its period lies, its period is short, and it lies in the peak range. So SA by G is to be taken 2.5. So two ways I can do the analysis. Either I can analyze the structure as a whole, but in that case, I have to ensure that I get sufficient number of modes so that I'm getting at least 90% mass participation. Alternatively, I can do an analysis of the tower separately, which I can use mode superposition or any dynamic analysis method, including time history, and whatever forces I'm getting after scaling the base shear to the empirical formula given in the code, the force I will apply or I will transfer in the basement portion. So this analysis can be performed in two steps. Now, when I'm having multiple towers, for example, here in the same basement, then the problem is even more complex. Uh, doing dynamic analysis of the whole structure with basement and towers is quite complex. Uh, interpretation of the results again becomes complex and scaling of the base shear at 
the either at the top level, top of the basement level, backstage level, or at the base level, that again is complex. So here also we can use the same simplification which we have discussed in the previous slide. The tower portions, all the towers we can analyze separately, assuming those to be fixed at the base. And the base shear here, I have to scale with the base shear which we are getting from the codal formula. And accordingly, this axial force in the columns and the moment will also be scaled up. So uh, this will also be these forces, all these forces will be scaled consistent with the base shear which we are getting from the empirical form. This I can do for any number of towers. I'm doing that independent analysis. And then I can perform the analysis of the basement by replacing these forces, okay, with uh, uh, opposite uh, or replacing the tower portion with the opposite forces which are acting, which are being transferred to the basement. And then the inertia forces in the basement and and is equal to 2.5. So that's how we can consider any number of towers, but we face they, those can vibrate together. Those can also vibrate away from each other. Those can also vibrate towards each other. So all the three possibilities we have to consider when both the vibrations are vibrating in phase, both the vibrations are vibrating out of phase towards each other or away from each other. So these three conditions I have to consider for analysis and design of the um, uh, back step at the, or the top floor of the uh, basement. So actually the lower floors of the basement, not only the top floor, top floor takes most of the load, but the lower floors of the basement also take some force. So all the floors of the basement, we should model using finite element model so that we are able to consider their stiffness. And for this stiffness, we have to perform two analysis using lower bound and upper bound um, stiffness. Now, the deformations which are occurring here, those you have to provide, you have to add to the forces, the, to the deformations which are occurring at the base of the tower. So the forces in the tower can be calculated using fixed base, but the deformation needs to be transferred from the basement to this portion. Okay. And uh, the bending moment in the bottom or, or in the portion of the tower, which is inside the basement below the ground level, the bending moment and shear force that will change, that will depend upon the stiffness of this top floor uh, back stay, main back stay stiffness. So the bending moment and shear force will be automatically considered when we are using the stiffness modifiers given in IS16700 for the main state as well as the bottom or the lower floors in the basement. So the tower portion analysis can be done dynamic, mode superposition or time history, but doing a time history analysis or uh, dynamic analysis or mode superposition analysis of the basement is quite cumbersome. So that can be done statically also it will not make much of the difference because in any case, this is quite rigid. So the code provides a limit on empirical period. Uh, earlier, it was followed from IS 1893, but in the draft uh, revision of IS 16700, a new formula has been suggested. Um, in the beginning, uh, Mr. Kulkarni has uh, introduced that um, there was a discussion in uh, EFC also uh, regarding uh, the new draft code. So the major change is in this period formula. And this period formula, this has been taken from ACI. So actually ACI has given these limits. So the value of X is 0.9. So here also it is 0.9. And then it is giving the coefficient for concrete frames at 0 0.016, but at the same time, it is also giving uh, modification factors in different zones. So the max, the minimum uh, 
modification which is occurring in the maximum seismicity area that is 1.4 so this 1.4 multiplied by 0.466 that has been proposed in our um, revised or draft revision it, it is still not published but the draft revision takes this it will be interesting how this formula is going to affect our design so this is the variation with height of the period as given in asc sub now if we compare it with our uh, is1893 formula so here what you see at the top this is the uh, moment rcc moment formula moment frame formula uh, as per the proposed is16700 and this blue cover curve here this is from is1893 and other systems are also defined in is1 revised uh, or draft revision of is16700 which is given by this yellow color so we can see that the other system is close to the bare frame given in is1893 and the formula for bare frame which we are obtaining from 16700 is much longer so at 50 meters the tall buildings occur uh, or tall buildings are defined beyond 50 meter so here you can see that the difference is significant and if we translate it in terms of uh, the base shear coefficient you can see here here it has been converted into base shear coefficient in different zones this is for zone 2 and in zone 2 we are allowing bare frame also so you can see that and this dotted line here i have plotted the minimum base shear coefficient which is defined in 16700 so we can see that at 50 story itself the minimum base shear starts governing and with this new formula the base shear design base shear will be governed by minimum base shear only then in zone 3 also it is close to 50 story zone 4 we know in zone 4 and 5 the bare frame is not allowed so they are having other uh, buildings that means either shear wall or some other structural system so for those the formula is this but what is given for other systems by yellow color so this is for other systems so up to let us say 100 meter building or 120 we can 110 we can say beyond 110 meter it will be the minimum base shear which will be governing because what we will be calculating using that formula is lower same is in case of zone 5 so this new formula has increased the period the design period significantly and it has reduced the design base shear so uh, it is not clear that how uh, or why this decision has been taken and why it is in discrepancy in is 1893 versus 16700 what i understand it that soon there will be a proposal to change the period formula in is 1893 also because the hazard code uh, is also being revised the is 1893 hazard part is also being revised and it appears that the hazard which is going to be revised will be much higher to compensate they, they, there is a preparation already going on to increase the period so that the design base shear can be reduced and there is not large impact on the design base shear but uh, what will happen during this transition period that is difficult to understand so still i will recommend that till this hazard portion is not revised please and in any case it is not yet published uh, the draft revision this is only a proposal and it is not yet published hopefully they will publish along with uh, the revised hazard then the design base shear will be compensated there will not be much effect on the final design base shear we are going to have then damping is another important parameter and uh, uh, the damping also depends on the period of the structure and height period depends on the height of the building so for tall buildings 5% damping is not available so pier etc 72 they have uh, done some measurement and plotted the damping which they have obtained in uh, different structure different buildings with number of stories and what is concluded is that this typically ranges from 2% to 4% up to 30 story buildings and 1 to 2% only in case of uh, 
buildings more than 30 percent so we have to select the damping also carefully that 5 percent damping is not available is not applicable in case of tall buildings then i was talking about this minimum base shear uh, coefficient which is defined in the code in different zones and in my comparison we have considered these uh, minimum base shear coefficients I will skip this. Another important issue in case of tall buildings, which our code has indicated, but it is not clear how uh, to take that into account, is the sequential nature of application of uh, gravity load. So here I'm not talking about earthquake load. I'm talking about dead load. So um, dead load does not occur on the on all the stories of the building simultaneously. We know the building is constructed in a sequence. And as a result, the dead load occurs sequentially. As the construction of the building story by story proceeds, the dead load also goes on increasing. Further, when we are constructing the second story, the deformation in the first story has already taken effect. The first is in the second story. So this construction sequence, effect of construction sequence in analysis for dead load is important. And actually, this analysis of an story building is like analyzing n buildings of different number of stories. So first, one story building subjected to load of first floor only. Then two story building subjected to the loads of second story and so on till the full structure subjected to the topmost story load. And results or member forces of these should be superimposed. This is applicable in case of dead load. In case of live load, that will be applied once the whole building is complete. And in any case, the effect of live load is not much. But the dead load is to be taken in like this. If we are using uh, masonry partitions, then the partition load either it may be applied after completing the full building we can start uh, putting the partitions from the bottom or sometimes the partitions are also following the construction sequence so accordingly that also needs to be considered in bridge design construction sequence is very important even some failures have been reported by not considering the bridge design buildings also especially tall buildings this is important and some of the software now are providing this facility to perform construction sequence analysis. So this is another point which we usually miss. And I thought that I will cover those. Then another issue is which our code specifies is the P delta effect. There is some confusion regarding P delta effect also in our industry that how, when we should take P delta effect into account and how we can consider those in analysis and design. So the effect of P delta is like applying an additional lateral force or it is causing additional deformation. So if we look in terms of the load displacement curve, so here H is the total horizontal force and delta is the displacement. What it is showing that uh, initially it is elastic, then it yields and then the degradation starts. Okay. So without P delta, this curve will be there. If we are using P delta, then this curve, the building will follow this curve. And what we see here, that the post yield stiffness reduces. After yield, there is a significant reduction in the stiffness. Or we can also consider it that due to P delta effect, this diagram has been rotated by an amount equal to PYH. And that much reduction in the capacity, especially the post yield at the yield, there is a reduction in the capacity and post yield, there is a reduction in the capacity. So the strength which is available to resist the horizontal force reduces because some part of that strength is consumed by these period effects. So period effects are important in case of tall buildings and those should be considered invariably. Two methods of P delta effects are usually uh, implemented in the software. The first method, we modify the stiffness matrix itself. So our conventional stiffness matrix is like this. For the six degree of freedom uh, system, we get 
the student of matrix, you may be familiar with this. But when we consider the periodic effect, we have an additional matrix which is subtracted from this. And as a result, the stiffness reduces. So at, in these four elements, PYL is subtracted here. It is added in the negative because it is minus. So these elements of the stiffness matrix reduce in value. And to calculate this reduction, we need the value of P, that means axial force. Problem is that the axial force is not known. Axial force in columns is not known before the analysis is performed. And for using P delta analysis um, with this method, I need P. So to solve that problem, most of the cases, what they do, they first perform an analysis for a gravity load first. Because gravity, in gravity load, P delta effects are not occurring. There is no delta, only axial force is there. And that axial force they are using for calculating P delta. So in, it is suggested that first you perform a, a nonlinear analysis uh, by considering gravity load. So whether you consider linear analysis or nonlinear analysis for gravity load, it doesn't matter. The answer will be same because no yielding is occurring. But when you are considering nonlinear analysis, it will use uh, the axial force which is occurring in the columns. It will store that. And then you can use those axial forces or the reduced stiffnesses which are obtained from nonlinear analysis in gravity load for performing the modal analysis. So the period, as a result of period effects, actually the period is also elongated. So period elongation will come into picture. The larger displacement will also come into picture and the moments in our members are going to increase as a result of P-delta effect. Alternatively, the P-delta effect can be done using what we call second order analysis. So we can perform a second order analysis. How much effect it can cause? Just to illustrate that, these are the two pushover curves in X and Y direction of a given building. And the period without P delta effect, it was 2.679 in period one. That has increased to 2.749. So slight increase has taken place. Now this increase will depend upon the height of the building. In a taller building, this effect may be more. And if you look at the P delta, uh, sorry, pushover curve, so you can see that pushover curve with uh, uh, black color is without P delta. And so the stiffness as well as the strength and there is very significant effect of P delta on the performance or the pushover of the building. Then sometimes we may like to use uh, time histories. We have to choose time histories. Now choosing time history is, is all to do time history analysis. We have to choose. And when we are choosing time histories from any available database, like peer database, that is one of the source from where we can select the time histories, we need to provide the target response spectrum. And then two possibilities are there. Either we can use the recorded time histories as such by scaling them. So we, in scaling, what we do, we multiply those by a, uh, constant factor. So for example, here, the target response spectrum, which we have used in our design is given by this blue cover and the response spectrum of the ground motion, which I have selected is let us say like this. So first what we do, we take that uh, ground motion whose response spectrum or shape of the response spectrum is very close to my target response spectrum. It may not match, but the shape should be similar. So that's what we do, the zero period, P equal to zero, which we also call EPGA, effective peak ground acceleration. So we scale it at this value. And when I scale it at this value, we can say, see that it is matching here, but it may not match at the other places in the responses, but equal to zero, which we also call, because I have multiplied this by a same, by constant. Uh, factor every uh, at every period. So if I'm multiplying the time history by a factor, it will never match 
identical or it will be never identical to my uh, target response spectrum. Some gap will be there. So there is an issue, which point I should use for scaling. One is this PGA. If I'm using PGA for matching, then the match time is to maybe above or below my uh, response spectrum. The other suggestion is that we match it at some other point such that at some places it is above, some places it is down, but overall it is close to my uh, target response spectrum. Another way of scaling is that we scale with respect to spectral acceleration at the fundamental period T1. So T1 is the period, the fundamental or the longest period of the building. We calculate the spectral acceleration of target response spectrum at same period. We calculate the spectral acceleration of the ground motion at the same period. And then we scale here. So as you can see in this right side figure, here it is matching exactly at this period T1. But then again, at other places, it is not matching. At some places, it is going above. And some places, it is going down. For linear analysis, if we are doing this analysis, this spectral matching with respect to fundamental period, that is considered to be good enough. So here, first set, original set without any scaling is there. And when we do scaling with respect to the period, the period of the structure, fundamental period of my building in this case is one second. So when we do scaling with respect to one second, at one second, all the response spectra of all the ground motions will coincide. But at other locations, there will be larger gap. So we can see there is significant difference at other periods. So in this method, we can match them only at one point. There is another method available in which I do not target any one point. I do not match my response spectrum at one point. Rather, I match those throughout a chosen range of the period such that the error or mismatch between that range is minimized. Then IS16700 has a limit on lateral drift. It is uh, referring to um, IS1893 and the maximum drift is 0.4. Now here we have to keep in mind that this 0.4%, 0.004, which is 0.4%, this is the interstory drift ratio at reduced load when it is divided, uh, when the analysis is performed using a response reduction factor, usually five. So actually, it is not the true interstory drift which will occur during earthquake. This is under the reduced earthquake force. Whereas in other codes, Euro code as well as uh, ASC7, the interstory drift limit is provided in terms of the total drift. And their drift is varying from three to five times of our drift, 0.4 times. So there it is between one, 1.5 to 3%. So it is roughly uh, three to 5% of uh, three to five times. That is actually the value of response reduction factor. So uh, what is given there? So when we are comparing our drift requirement with other codes, we have to be careful that only in our code it is provided for the reduced earthquake force. Whereas in other codes, it is for the elastic earthquake force or the full earthquake force. Now, in case of new or this draft IS16700, revised 16700, a change has been done. And that change is that in place of this 0.4%, uh, percent, they have specified a stability coefficient. And that stability coefficient is defined like this, theta pi delta i over vi hi minus one r, and the limit is given as 0.2. So here pi is the total design vertical load at that level. Suppose I'm calculating in the ground story where chances of maximum interstory drift are there, then it will be the total seismic weight of the structure, that will be PI. Then delta I is the drift in that story. And VI is the shear force, story shear force. If we are, I'm considering the ground story, then VI will be base shear. And HI minus one is the height of the story below. 
So in the bottom story, it, it will be equal to the height of the bottom story and divided by R. That should be less than 0 0.2. Apparently, this formula has an error. And I will explain that what is the error in this. This has been taken from ASC 722 because ASC 722 has two uh, criteria for interstory drift. One is a uh, criteria in terms of maximum interstory drift in place of 0.4%. They have something like between 1.5 to 2% for different types of structures. And another one is this stability coefficient. So this stability coefficient is very similar to what we have here. Only thing is that in our case, they have added R. So here that R is not appear. And if we do the substitution, I have done it. I have calculated it for John 2, 3, 4, and 5 using this formula by putting the value of R is equal to 5. So we can get this in terms of uh, this VI by PI, we, we can take as the minimum uh, base shear because VI is the base shear. PI is the seismic weight. If we are calculating it for the ground story, then VI is the total seismic weight and PI is the base shear. So this becomes the, sorry, VI is the base shear and PI is the total seismic weight. So this becomes the design base shear coefficient and the minimum design base shear coefficient, what is given in the code. So if I take VI by PI even minimum, then delta I by HI becomes 0.0014 into R. So 0.14 percent into R. Zone 3, it is like this. Now, this R appears to be wrong. If I calculate it for zone 5, then delta I by HI becomes 0 0.032 by R. So for example, here you can see in zone 5, if I use R is equal to 5, this will become 4.8 into 2. So roughly 2.5%, which is much larger than uh, suggested by any other code. So what this 0.48%, that appears to be okay. So it looks like that this R here has been used mistakenly to, um, because in our case, the VI by PI is already uh, reduced by the response reduction factor. So this R is perhaps not necessary. So if we get rid of R, then those values are reasonable. So I will skip this. I will skip this also. Okay. So um, it is very important that we consider the cracked section differences. And in case of cracked section differences for slabs, beams, columns, and wall, our code has provided different factors. So in case of unfactored loads, that means in the serviceability condition, the cracked moment of inertia is given as 0.35 for slab, for 0.7 for the beams, 0.9 for the columns and wall. But in case of ultimate criteria, factored load means ultimate uh, criteria, ultimate limit state, for slabs, it is only 25%. For beams, it is 0.35 and columns 0.7. So we can see that this is matching with what is given in IS 1893. There, they have not defined perhaps, if I remember correctly, the track section stiffness for the slabs is not defined. But uh, for beams and columns, it is matching with IS 1893. In case of backstage slab, we have to perform a sensitivity analysis between 0.5 and 0.2, if I remember correctly. So in one case, a higher- 15. Sorry, 0 0.15. 0 0.15. So 0.5 and 0.15. So, uh, uh, a moderate earthquake where uh, some cracking has occurred. So both the extremes we have to consider because in one case, we are going to get higher moment at the um, junction at the interface of the back stay and the shear wall. Whereas in other case, we are going to get higher moment near the base, near the foundation. Okay, then there are different clauses of the code 
uh, we could discuss those one by one, but uh, I have already covered all the background behind these clauses. And if there is any question, any doubt regarding the clauses which are given in IS 16700, we can take up in the question answer session. I hope your doubts you have about any clause you have already put in the question answer session. So we will take up those one by one there. So uh, this part of the webinar, I will stop here and uh, we will continue with the question answer session. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Yogendra Singhji. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation and uh, you made it simple for uh, everyone. Uh, so we will straight away go to the question answer session and myself and Mr. Arvind Parulekar, both of us will conduct this session. Anandara, can I ask you whether you need five meters or whether we should start? Uh, doctor, <coughs> doctor, you need five meters or we, you should start? We can start, we can continue. Okay, okay. Thank, okay. You. No problem. Thank you. Okay. So I think both this are uh, <clears throat> okay. I see there are 28 questions. Yeah, so we will take up the third question. A C-shaped uh, wall can be analyzed as three columns with uh, rigid beam column offsets. In this case, there shall be three separate column designs. When the C-shaped wall is analyzed and designed by APM in ETAPS, it is usual practice to give it as a single label. Would this not lead to difference in design? Would the design be similar if three different peer labels are given in ETAPS? So slightly different question from today's topic, but... Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very much relevant. I, I covered that. Yes, C-shaped shear wall can be analyzed either a finite element model uh, given in the form of uh, the shape of the shear wall or three columns interconnected by rigid beams. In both the cases, we have to design the shear wall as one because the flange C section will act as one. So when we are uh, using finite element method, then also we have to integrate the stresses over the whole C shape section. When we are modeling those as three columns, then also we have to integrate the whole moment acting on the section. So those actual force which we'll get in the flanges, we will convert those into moments because one side flange column will be subjected to larger force or maybe even tension. Other side flange column will be subjected to compression. So the, when we will be calculating the moment, we will take into account the difference of the actual forces in the columns also. So design will be in any case as a single section, whether we are modeling it using columns or we are modeling you modeling it using finite elements. Okay, thank you. Uh, Can I put one question? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Please go ahead. This methodology of what you have stated is very good as per code, but when a boy in the field is given to design, he ultimately produces a design which there should be some problem in the construction. And there, if there is problem is not there, there will be problem in other side. So how do you want to tackle this gap? I think uh, construction problems we have not talked and perhaps I am not the right person. The construction problems can be better taken by Mr. Parlekar and uh, Mr. Anand Kulkarni because they have more field experience. They are interacting with the construction people. So maybe in some other um, uh, webinar or a physical workshop, those problems also we can take up. But I'm not the uh, right person. I do not have much field experience. So for me, it is difficult to... Uh, Okay, about. If the design portion in find some problem with the student to implement the design assumptions in the design. No, design will be done as per drawings. So in design, he will not do any any assumption. Assumptions we have to do in design itself. Yes. So when design. the designer will be designing, then no. they have to take into account how 
the construction will actually take place. So in some cases, the designer has to suggest the construction sequence also, that uh, whatever construction sequence they have assumed in their design, same should be followed. In case of bridges, it is compulsory to suggest uh, the design, the construction sequence also by the designer. But perhaps in case of a tall building also, whether uh, the designer has considered uh, one story design at a time or multiple story design at a time, that needs to be communicated in the drawing. And they, there is an interaction in advance with the uh, contractor and the designer, and that issue is decided. That is exactly what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, let's Arvind go ahead with our question answer. Yeah. Arvin, can you take a yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next question is uh, actually uh, answered, but there is a small uh, difference in there. What is right approach for modeling when we have multi towers without any expansion rights? Separate tower model with adjoining one band or tower together. You have already answered that you should take basement separately and tower separately. But only uh, I wanted to add in this question then to whether the, uh, the suggested method of separate basement and tower and separate tower model with adjoining one bay. That is, that is means it's a, it is a horizontal support giving will give the same results or they will be different no it 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 will it will uh, not give the same results because if we are considering um, the portion of the slab portion. portion of the slab then the results will depend on how much portion of the back stress slab we are considering so the problem there is where where to consider the limit what so is the if proportion of it to be fixed at the back yeah. level? It will yeah. be on it's the only assumption. It's only an assumption at adjoining one bay. And moreover, when the when adjoining one bay will not have that basement shear wall, then it will give a very different results. Yeah. And so the, the, the correct method will be this basement. The separate. ideal method will be that we make full model, even consider the soil stiffness and perform a time history analysis where- That is very practical. I'm saying ideal. I'm saying ideal, not practical. practical. This is ideal. So yeah. we have to always keep that in mind and whatever um, simplification we are doing, it has to be with respect to that. And there is one more problem there that how to uh, do BV bar by BV correction, where to scale the base shear at the top level or at the bottom level. So it is suggested that even if you have done analysis, some people, some designers, actually it has come to me, uh, it was referred to me, some designers, they are doing analysis of the full model, including basement. They have modeled the shear wall, uh, uh, the retaining wall of the basement also. But they want to do the base shear correction at the base, not at the top. So there is a problem. That is if, we are, if we are doing, uh, because code does not specify any base shear for the combined basement and superstructure, basement and tower. It, it specifies base shear, BVR, only for the tower portion. So we have to add the static component of the base shear, which will be acting on my basement while comparing BVR with BV for the full structure. So that, that is also to be considered. So if, if we are considering this basement separately and the tower separately, it gives an idea into this behavior also, an insight into that behavior, that how I should compare the static base shear with my dynamic base shear, or that BV bar by BV correction, when I'm modeling the full structure. Yeah, ideally it should be applied uh, at the podium top level because- uh, Either it should be compared at the podium top level or basement top, I will say, <laughs> even if uh, there is a portion of podium and uh, superstructure and tower, <laughs> Above basement, we can consider that also IS 1893 gives a formula where the two periods are average or weighted average of the two, two periods, some, something like that we, we can do. Uh, but the basement portion, which is quite rigid, we should we should not forget to That's consider the important. static shear force acting on that. This is important. So let's move to the next question where uh, he wants to know whether, uh, okay, sir, in IS 16700, they did not 
provide the maximum height and slenderness ratio limits for frame tube structures uh, system for uh, different seismic zone. Maybe you want to know the reason. So uh, they have given uh, tube into. So generally, frame tube will not be used alone. It will be in tube into. If I remember correctly, the last column is tube into. No. Yeah. So last is structure wall plus frame tube. So structure wall plus frame tube means a tube into system. So because uh, when we are talking about tall buildings, there will be always a service core. And it is always advisable to use a shear wall in the service core. So actually, it means to that only. Pure uh, frame tube will never be used okay. until unless it is bundled. OK, thank you. Over to you, Arvind. Yeah. Uh... Sir, uh, shall the section properties be crack properties of, uh, of geometric properties? Slide number 38, he wanted to refer. So while considering period limitations, there is a limitation to period. 38, 38 is regarding uh, periods. Oh, so question yeah. is that why is that putting period? Which properties we should consider? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it has to be cracked section properties, including P delta effect. Because period gets elongated due to P delta effect also. So we have to consider the cracked section properties, including P delta effect. Okay, so next question is uh, about the modifiers that we should consider for basement uh, walls, that is the retaining walls probably. <laughs> yeah, so for basement walls, uh, same what we are using for shear walls and it won't make much difference because in any case those are very rigid. So the stiffness of those is very high and most of the cases we will be performing um, uh, static analysis there. So it is not going to affect the period but yes it can affect the back stay effect to some extent. So for that the crack um, section modifiers are already given in the course. Yes. I wanted to have some reference books names for design of tall buildings. Any any suggestions we can make? Uh, tall buildings, there are few books, but seismic design of tall buildings, yeah. the books are not there. So mostly these documents, ATC, uh, Los Angeles Tall Building Board, these documents, these I can share. So, and uh, this book by uh, Mohile, it is not specifically for tall buildings, but it covers most of the issues of tall buildings. It caters to all types of buildings, but uh, most of the issues of tall buildings are covered by him. Okay. Let's move to the next question. Can you please explain again, figure B of slide 45, how CU and TU is linked with shear force V? Okay, so I will share my screen again. I think it's visible now. Yes. Okay, so uh, the total force which is registered is partly through shear at the interface, partly through the compression here and partly through tension. So we can calculate how much force the tension uh, can be transferred through tension. That I can do by taking the area of this steel because tensile force will be transferred through uh, steel only. So area of this steel will give me the tension. And here I will get the compressive force which, will be, which can be transferred through this uh, strut action of uh, uh, collector uh, element and then the force which can be transferred through shear. So the total force, sum of these two, should be equal to the total shear force uh, demand coming from the diaphragm. So there are three modes of transfer. 
one is tension in reinforcement one is compression in this strut and one is uh, the shear direct shear taking place for example suppose i provide an opening here near to my shear wall i have provided an opening that can it transfer uh, shear force uh, or not yes it can transfer the shear force that will be equal to the tensile force the capacity of these uh, reinforcement in tension and then the strut action of this portion the shear action will not be available correct and aci 318 provides expressions for all the three portions to be calculated fine okay so i think we can go to the next next question yeah arvin can you yeah 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 by providing back stretch uh, he is asking about sensitivity analysis by providing back stretch in shear wall bending moment will be column or in combination system column bending moment will be like shear wall by carrying sensitive analysis for two different things for uncracked and cracked slab so bending moment diagram will differ what he wanted to know is if the one of the action is a, a shear like shear wall or other is a like column so sorry it looks like parole uh, is exactly dissect to design am i audible sir uh, i don't uh, your connection was we, disconnected yeah. some time in between i could not get the actual question i could understand that this question is I related connected. with the sensitivity analysis but what is the question no, what, what, what sensitivity yeah it is related to sensitive and what he is asking uh, is that whether after sensitive analysis if one of the actions uh, shear wall behavior and other gives column behavior design is it possible uh, like that No, Or I don't understand what what is meant by shear wall behavior being like column behavior. Ha, but I mean, what he meant to say is uh, by one of the design, if the if there is a uh, point of counter flexure and if other design, if there is no point of counter flexure, then it will. So, point of counter flexure uh, will not come because of this. Point of counter flexure comes. because of rigid beams if the beams are very rigid so only thing is that how sharply the shear force and bending it moment not come that's what that's what i'm saying so, so only forces will change basic behavior will not change yes basic behavior will not change only thing is that the uh, sharpness <coughs> so of, of the bending course. moment diagram in the shear wall yeah, will i think anand continue because my um, connection seems to be good. Yeah, so the distribution the distribution of the force will change at that level. Right. Okay. So uh, let's move to the next question. Slide fifty four fifty five. If there are three basement floors, should the middle two floors stiffness on basement shall be ignored? And what <coughs> model? No, all the floors of the basement should be considered. Maximum force transfer will take place through the top. Uh, basement, but depending on the stiffness of the top uh, floor, the lower floors will also be subjected to uh, diffraction for the influences. So all the uh, basement floor should be modeled using finite element model shell. Right. Yeah. Okay. The next question is, uh, how are the translational and rotational spring stiffnesses calculated? In basement, uh, backstay problems. Translation uh, and backstay analysis of what soil? Yeah. Where where is where are the translation and rotation stiffnesses of a spring? Soil perhaps it looks like that he yes, is representing soil by by springs. There don't be any other. Perhaps in my slide I have shown it by spring and rotational spring. Perhaps that's so. When we will model. Uh, the foundation with the finite element and piles using beams and uh, soil with springs that is stiffness will be automatically considered so it, what i have shown in my drawing is only the 
this question is very difficult to understand why uh -huh. is the damping of tall buildings lesser i don't think this question is clear let's move to the next question okay the question is about how to perform uh, the construction sequence analysis on uh, etabs maybe we can take up this as a separate topic, separate topic for, when we will have the hands on because yeah. uh, etabs has that command so maybe sometime we have to have a hands on session uh, on sequential analysis also yeah arvind would you like to take yeah, the next question i think that uh, this from mr vidhayak naik for multiple towers with common basement can we lump the mass base share of each tower distributed within the footprint of each each tower on the top of basement floor and analyze the basement structure separate vertical elements occur at base of each tower on top of the base base basement the design doesn't change as they go through to the basement therefore only the basement element need to be designed for which the mass and base share of each tower are sufficient yeah This is uh, that is okay. Uh, that is the explanation of, yeah. of our method. What where we have suggested that tower you can analyze separately. He has explained that in more detail. What, But one caution here that while transferring the base shear from the tower, it will not be only base shear. It will be overturning moment also. Yes. So not only base shear, the moment that will be in the form of member moments. as well as the axial forces added axial forces that will be missing that will be missing if you consider lump mass at that right. right right yes sir so next question is uh, slide number 58 while considering whole structure tower plus basement assuming basement is rigid below the grade level For equivalent static analysis, it is easy to give earthquake force input from tower base to rooftop. However, while performing response spectrum analysis, the natural periods and mode shapes of entire structure, tower plus basement, will be considered. Hence, distribution of lateral force in response spectrum will be incorrect. No, it is not incorrect. Can If you do uh, uh, model analysis of the whole structure. you will see that in the fundamental mode in the initial modes it will be only tower which will be vibrating so in structures where we have large difference in stiffness in the initial modes it will be only the upper portion so fundamental mode will be more or less like uh, that that it is the tower is vibrating with base fixed at the back still level only in very higher modes uh, in very higher modes where frequency is much larger period is much shorter they are only the basement will start uh, participating so initial modes participation of basement will not be there so basement will remain uh, rigid so there won't, there is not going to be much error in the period uh, next question whether uh, is a uh, question is that we not clear whether p delta need to be considered if double height walls is proposed is the mistake Any, any, any structure any area good practice good habit any structure any component you are designing consider period time right so there is a question regarding can we get the ppt uh, uh, for future reference yes yeah, sure not only ppt you will get the video Two stage analysis is specified in AC seven uh, and can be used for building with basements void. That stiffness ratio of basement and tower is satisfied. Minimum requirement uh, entire structure shall be greater than one point one times the period of upper portion considered. as separate structure supported at the transition from upper to lower tower portion generally this method is used for lightweight that is steel or wood frame structures resting on 
स्टील कॉन्क्रीट बेसमेंट और ओडियम is an explanatory note beyond uh, what we have discussed so that is correct it is an explanation of statement if we do it for rcc structures also where the basement is having uh, continuous retaining walls as we were discussing these are not so called diaphragm walls then these conditions will be easily satisfied so this is valid for rcc uh, buildings with rcc basements also not only for timber building. So the question, question here is, is that a two two stage analysis uh, can we uh, use it as a general solution or it has to meet this uh, particular uh, two conditions that is the uh, stiffness ratio and uh, the time period uh, factor of one point one. Yeah, so that is could... correct. The limit what he has said is correct. We should use in that limit because if the basement is not stiff enough as compared to a tower yeah then we cannot assume the tower to be fixed at the back stay level okay and participation of the basement we will get in the lower modes also so if the basement is adequately rigid as compared to the tower area and that will happen if you have basement larger than the tower and it is provided with the retaining wall Uh, right. I'll take the next question directly to, related to diaphragm action. What are the best strategies for ensuring diaphragm action for building new atriums? I will add to this whether this diaphragm action uh, uh, adequacy is checked by software uh, by some means or how how you how how we can ensure that means that is also a practical question because there are so there are so many uh, odd diaphragm shapes with some small links and all such things. So how to ensure that? Okay. In, 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 so, in, in, perhaps when you say adequacy of diaphragm action means rigid diaphragm. Can yeah, you say this as rigid diaphragm? Yeah, rigid diaphragm? So for that, the clause is already there. No, I'm the, that is okay. That is related to deflection, but uh, I'm talking about basic geometrical shape. Suppose suppose shapes are like that. Ki some uh, C-shaped C-shaped C-shape wall. You is can a, take any any diaphragm, any shape, any cutout, provided no, you design it. I am not talking about that uh, that uh, action. Huh. When so most of many times it happens, happens uh, that shear wall is almost outside the building. Mm -hmm. Means uh, like, uh, that the lift wall generally they are right. almost right. outside right. the building and right. connected by a small portion small of the piece, slab. Small piece of slab. slab. So whether right. whether it is to be considered as that, uh, I am talking about that connectivity, not overall. Right. Diaphragm. So in in case of see when you are sure that it okay. is. It will act as rigid diaphragm. Then you can model it rigid diaphragm. Wherever there is any doubt, you model slab also using shell element. Shell element. Yeah, that's what and, I was coming and to. And that mention. will automatically take into account the stiffness because we will use crack suction stiffness. So, so, so it will take into account the stiffness. It will also give you the forces. Then check the reinforcement also for those forces. Correct. Almost and uh, many many practical buildings we have to do that because a lot of times this such a small connectivity. Yes. If if we want to use a fancy shape, and uh, so we have to put more effort. Yeah, correct. <laughs> As the price that we have to pay. Yeah. So correct. now uh, next question is from Mr. Ruthwick. He is asking uh, maybe the. Meaning of his question is that uh, which is that when you are doing a non-linear analysis for coupled uh, shear walls, which which is the preferred location or the desired location for uh, the plastic hinge formation? So plastic hinge location, the desired plastic hinge location in case of uh, coupled shear wall is first at the two ends of the uh, coupling beam and then at the base of the two uh, shear walls, coupled shear walls. These are our targeted uh, locations. Location, right. Uh, in the next question, is slightly still not clear. In amendment for IS 16700, in P delta initial load combinations, seismic wind forces are included. Is it necessary as the net axial forces will be zero? I couldn't understand this. Nothing. Net axial forces. 
oh they are saying that uh, okay the axial force due to overturning which will occur one side columns will go into compression and other side columns will go into tension and net force has to be zero so mm -hmm. why to consider the axial force in uh, the period type fact mm -hmm. that that appears to be the yeah, that appears appears to be question yeah. okay so uh, uh, distribution of vertical load or axial force due to lateral load depends on the configuration of the structure so net force will be zero but its effect on the stiffness may be different on different components so that's why the code is saying that we should consider the pdl type fact in while considering pdl type fact the axial force due to all combinations we should do the next question uh, which is asked by mr sachin jain uh, the wording is not clear so i'll just skip that question we move to the next question uh, by mr rajwardhan reddy uh, he is asking us a slightly philosophical question how to improve stiffness of structure in spite of architectural restrictions <laughs> so you can use stronger i mean stiffer material in place of concrete use steel use uh, composite sections okay and higher grade uh, steel uh, higher grade concrete and uh, other than fractional numbers you raises then you will get higher and use the infills also make the use of uh, in infill going to crack and uh, interstory those are not going to help in interstory next question by Mr. Vijay Jadhav, though is not related to today's, uh, 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 but important table six is one and three. First three modes three modes should contribute sixty five percent mass participation. Okay. Whether it should be collective for first three modes in each principal direction or individual mode. Yeah, that clause is quite confusing. Yeah, correct. It is. Correct. It, is, it, is uh, it it has several interpretations. Yeah. So I have seen uh, people interpreting it differently. What I understand is. that the first three modes may be coupled it may not be always separated mode that first mode is in x direction second mode is in y direction third mode is in rotation so it is possible that the first three modes may have contribution in x y and theta together so what i understand is that when you combine the first three modes the participation in each direction should be 65% minimum i practically i feel it is difficult to achieve unless it's a very perfect uh, building because uh, you will have to go beyond three modes to uh, get the 65% uh, mass okay. participation now i understand and i do not know what is the basis of that because if your fundamental mode is not contributing significantly it only means that your building is irregular or complex in that case you have to perform the analysis adequately but not to use that building that is not very clear that why not why not to use that building why that building cannot be constructed that's not very clear the question from mr deepak yes. is already answered i think yeah and yeah. Uh, then uh, sir you could you explain more about scaling for dynamic analysis for the tower and calculate the time period for software like etaps it is to be done in manually i think there is no you can't do it in etaps directly scaling nay nice. scaling we can do in etaps using the scale factor scale factor we always ha ah, nay that is manually or we are to put it manually only yeah, we have to put while it doing two yeah he is asking about while doing two stage analysis so one stage cannot be connected directly to it you have to do put it manually no uh, i am not saying that you have to do two stage analysis two stage analysis is only a simplified method okay. you can always go for the full structure analysis that is ideal that is always desirable so if you can do two stage analysis i mean full analysis need not to go for two stage analysis you can do it only care there is only dispute there is 
how to do vv var by vv correction so i want to highlight here that when you are doing the full analysis and you are doing vv var by vv correction at the base mm. do not forget to include the static component of the base shear corresponding to sa by g equal to 2.5 in the base shear vv var which is coming for <coughs> tower portion only it should not happen that vv var you have calculated for tower and you are scaling it at the base of the building that is not justified many smart designers do that also okay the next question i think you have already answered but uh, let's let's take it again uh, in case of multiple towers the common basement with common basement what is your opinion on modeling individual towers with some portion of basement around the tower is it covers backstay effect so uh, that is actually depends on the uh, the portion proportion of the portion exactly. of how the, much how uh, much portion that we are uh, that is different next question is for basement yeah. with retaining walls is it necessary to design the retaining wall for the shear transferred through the diaphragm from the tower yes but usually that will not govern the design the because problem. the length of the shear wall is so large that hardly you will get any shear stress it is it is not a problem at all it's it's very easy very less forces we get in the uh, retaining walls as shear wall acting in in plane direction the design will be mostly governed by out of plane force due to uh, soil pressure Yes, Anand. Yeah, I'm just going through the mm. uh, questions. Bit key back and key rotational, which I mentioned in slide fifty-five. Is there any literature available? Okay, let's go to the. This should not apply. Okay, for calculation of any element. displacement ideally we should not apply any modifiers or we need to check the crack moment stiffness modifiers not clear okay. not clear i think you have to refer to the service model mm -hmm. actually service modifiers you have to apply okay There are some very basic questions. So, okay, building with structural wall system, do we need to follow IS one three nine two zero for ductile detailing, even though building is in zone two? Is a question by Rama Govindu. Yeah, so one three nine two zero does not uh, ask zone two buildings to be uh, detailed. As per one three nine two zero, so it is not mandatory, but it is a good practice. One more interesting question is if a model, yeah, yes, sir. If a model is analyzed with podium and tower, then should we reduce the modifier from point seven or point point nine to point zero one so that the base shear is not fully taken by retaining wall? Uh, base shear is taken by retaining wall. Why? Why we should? Why we don't want the base shear to be yeah, taken correct. by retaining wall. Retaining wall should take base shear. They are actually taking. Yes. Okay. So how to superimpose superstructure loads and moment at basement structure? Should we take load and moments in every load case, one by one by one case? Yeah. Case or by one by one load case? And superimpose separately with every load phase. So, like we are doing in case of other structures, we do analysis for primary load phases and we do combinations later. And we are doing linear analysis only. So, combinations are uh, valid in non-linear analysis. That may not be valid, but in linear analysis, if you do analysis separately for dead load separately, live load separately, uh, earthquake load separately, wind load separately, and then make the combination. So, same way Super it is to be done. This is to be done only for earthquake. next question by benet sir can you elaborate why the energy dissipation is more when a plastic hinge forms at the base 
for the same curvature ductility why the displacement ductility is lesser for the plastic hinge at locations other than the base so uh, we can understand it <laughs> let me my patch book I will share my screen. So I think my screen is visible. Yes, sir. So I have two cases. Let us say the shear wall. In one case, the hinge is formed here. And another case, the hinge is formed here. So in the first case, for the same plastic rotation here, theta p, this is the delta p. And whereas here, for this theta p, this is delta p. So we can see that in the second case, delta p is, let us say this is h dash, and this is h. So delta P is H into theta P and delta P dash is H dash into theta P. So we can see that the plastic deformation in case of intermediate hinge is going to be less. And as a result, the energy dissipated in the second case will be less, less. because it depends upon the displacement ability. Okay, so let's take the last question now of the session, question answer session. Uh, yeah. One second, I'm just, uh, yeah. This question is by Mr. Rooshak. Is there any, is there any special criteria for design of collector element? And is there any maximum length limit of this collector element? This is an interesting question because it whether it will give some uh, LYR ratio also to be considered or something like that. Okay. See, LYR ratio will come into picture when we are having a steel element, which is not connected with the diaphragm. If it is connected with the diaphragm, then um, uh, buckling yeah. is ruled out. Buckling will not occur. Out so, of plane buckling is not possible. Uh, yes, you are right. Out of plane yeah, out of, buckling, out of buckling can happen. Na, sir. Yes, out of plane buckling can happen. Yes. But I have not seen any criteria for uh, that uh, about the length. I have not seen because that perhaps is to be followed as per the steel core. So whatever compressive force is there, we have to look for the steel core. Yeah. But design yeah. is available in ACI 318. Correct. But that is again related to the say a question I was discussing in the morning that mm -hmm. suppose they, they, the levels are not same. There are some in between, uh, they are in between some, uh, you can say there are some different levels at different right. places. Right. And in that condition, almost we are, it's very impossible to do that. Uh, no, we can do the finite uh, element modeling. Of uh, the then we have to do the finite area. Yeah, finite element between beams will be will go into torsion right. or something like that. Yeah, so there, there may be some uh, vertical elements of the slab. Yeah. There will be some horizontal elements at different levels. Mm. So the whole uh, uh, shape, whatever depressions, elevations it is following, I have to model. And then I will know forces at every section. And every section needs to be checked for the applied actual force, bending moment, and shear force. Yeah. I mean that total compression force will decide whether the out of plane uh, ah, correct that is true but yeah, if it is very so high then out of plane buckling has to be that is a, and the effective area uh, of the slab that is going to act as a collector element if there is a beam i don't think this possibility will uh, in case of beam it is not there it is possible but, only in case of steel slab. member i am yeah. using and i am using a uh, slender steel member 
then i i i i i will share one uh, typical section just uh, okay. two, one minute okay okay please. i will share that ek second so is it visible yes it is visible now so you, you can see it's almost if you there is a tower and then this element is right yeah this is almost zigzag because right. of various other things yes yeah so this is a typical situation at many podium uh, many basement mm. tops it is it's not it is single section it is, it is seen like that but in other direction also is like that so actually what i am worried about is this vertical element uh, near the level uh, difference yeah level near difference them. it will give out high forces yeah, it, will, it will be subject to very high out of plane forces yeah, yeah correct be subject to some torsional forces as well yeah. in, yeah, in plane it will not be a big problem but it will be subjected to out of plane forces out of plane yeah correct so that is a very difficult case to do that yes if you show all the plan anyway we yeah, can yeah, send yeah, it to yeah, doctor yeah. then we can review yeah. that because with but, uh, we can make a capacity. full model of the basement <laughs> and transfer all the forces coming from the towers mm -hmm. and whatever forces are coming in different elements mm -hmm. we can design for that yeah yeah erwin uh, i think in that case you know you can provide some stiffeners you know for ah, that, stiffeners uh, in between the period yeah. Yeah. yeah so that the uh, Like force uh, from the yeah. uh, the yeah, upper is... level to the lower level will get transferred uh, effectively. Yeah. So okay. we are uh, coming to the uh, end of this question and answer session. Thank you, doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is one question uh, which is uh, I'm just taking up for the information of everybody. Somebody has asked uh, where this recording will be available. This recording will be available on our YouTube channel. You can go to the YouTube channel, Epicons Friends of Concrete. and after a couple of days this recording will be available and uh, about ppt how it will be available arvin yeah, ppt will be sent to after uh, you send a feedback to this uh, we will be sending to all all of uh, we will be giving one uh, questionnaire like feedback and uh, along with that feedback after we receive feedback we will send a ppt also so, doctor doctor you have no objection uh, for sending ppt yeah. Ah, no, I have no no objection for. Yeah, okay, okay, fine. I will create a PDF file. This can be freely yeah, shared. No, 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 no. PPT means PDF only. I am not. Only. Sorry, sorry. It's not PPT. It's PDF. It's a PDF. Yes. We will make PDF and then we. Yeah, will it's not. It's not PPT. It's PDF. Yeah. I, I, okay, so now uh, I hand over it uh, this to Mr. Jain Pulkarni for uh, concluding remarks. Well. the lecture and presentation was so elaborate and excellent so concluding remark would be very difficult but i will straight away go to vote of thanks first of all we thank dr yogendra singh and we'll show next slide that what was the cross section of the participant that talks about his popularity and from where and how the participants are attracted so something has happened also beyond effort beyond our effort because we had been at least two or three person from our office had been continuously following of the participant past participant colleges and such a different grand uh, cross section has at, has been attending this webinar next is dr pc basu because he is our very old thought leader and probably our entire love towards our quick engineering series started with him gargi sir has left but gargi sir also has contributed in many of our webinars for the this topic and similarly other topics also this time mr mandale he is a chief engineer water resources from mcgm he also attended the webinar which was also boost to us and of course all the participants in such a large number you are attending that gives you us some kind of boost to organize the next webinar and all our staff all our uh, organizers i thank everybody with this we can say which is uh, today's webinar is 
uh, over. We can always be with us. 137 webinar is not decided yet, but we are into structural design, proof checking of tall building, structural audit, assessment of NDT, concrete quality monitoring services, PMC, architectural and little engineering. And of course, if you have any new topic in mind for training, please convey it to us. Please watch our YouTube channel and subscribe with this. I thank everybody and declare that webinar is closed. Thank you. Thank you, Kulkarni sir, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank see you sir. soon some other place, some some other uh, webinar or workshop. Sure. Bye bye. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bossu sir, for joining. Mandali sir, namas, namaskar and thank you. Apli kai orak nai pa jani phone orti chorak nai pa jani hai. Pan te wadai avar kiti mi ala atu hai karun bada vata. Thik hai, close kariya, shall we close? Yes, sir.